Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Tom Florian. I will serve as your host today for the Iowa High School Speech Association webinar for judges and coaches. I would like to welcome you again this morning uh, for our wonderful webinar. We have three great panelists for you today. Um, before we begin, though, I'd like to cover some logistics. As you all join and would like to interact with today's presentation, please know that the chat function has been disabled. We'd like to limit the chat today, but we would like to utilize the question and answer function of the webinar. So if you'll see at the bottom of your screen, potentially the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Go ahead and click that and you'll be able to ask questions to our panelists throughout today's presentation. Um, these questions will be able to be answered in real time as the presenters are able. We'll also have time to go through these questions and provide answers at the end of each presentation. So please do uh, get comfortable with that function and please feel free to submit questions throughout the day today. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded and Craig will be able to post that to the website following today's presentation, uh, either later today or potentially early next week. So if you are unable to stay with us throughout the entire day, it will be available for viewing afterwards as well. So those are the logistics. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director of the Iowa High School Speech Association, Mr. Craig Enan. Well, good morning. It is a great day for speech in Iowa, and you knew I was going to say that. It is wonderful that you're here with us. We're truly excited about doing this format. And like Tom said, we have some amazing presenters for you today to do this workshop. We're reaching over 200 individuals throughout the state of Iowa today, so we're thrilled about that. Uh, a couple things that I want to say to you all is that, number one, it is being recorded. We will post this on the website. This was set up by our judge certification group. Our judge certification group is Dirk Waller, Council Bluffs, Mark Moorhead, uh, Galen Catholic, Debbie DeVore, Maquoketa Valley, Vince Haraski, Tri Center, Lisa Fife, Waverly Shellrock, and Stacey Hansen, our coach at large. Special thanks to them and special thanks to our presenters. Also, thank you to Tom. Tom, uh, you may remember that last name because his lovely wife has been an All-State critic multiple times for us. And she works with the Iowa Musical Theater Championships. And Tom does amazing things for us in the Iowa High School Speech Association. If you're doing this for judge certification, please remember you need to send me an email with your address. And then next week, Monday, I will send you the test booklet. So all you have to do to be certified is to take the test online, pass the test, and then send in your card. The judges' cards were already sent to judges that were certified already. So that is the easiest part to do. Please understand we're thrilled about this and I'm not gonna take any more time because I wanna to get to our first presenter. Our first presenter in the area of acting events will be Carl Limburg. Carl is the chair of the Des Moines uh, Area Community College Theater. He's done amazing things with that theater program. It has grown tremendously. Carl's originally from Central California area. He, um, he saw the light, he came to Iowa, and we're thrilled that he finally came to uh, God's country here in Iowa. He has been a critic for us in both the IE and the Allstate area. You are going to truly enjoy Carl Lindbergh. Carl Lindbergh. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, it, this is, uh, I'm feeling some pressure going first. I can't see you. I'm used to teaching where I force everybody to be in gallery mode. So good morning, everybody. Uh, as Craig said, I'm from Central California. Uh, I'm the program chair for DMAC Ankeny Theater, which is a flagship program within the Simon Estes School of Fine Arts um, here at DMAC. And uh, I'm the incoming interim district chair of humanities. So doing more and more, we have grown a lot and uh, Iowa has been, has been interesting. Um, we don't have weather like y'all do here in California, we don't. So uh, it, it's, it's been fun, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am gonna share my screen. Um, with you all so that you can see a bit of a um, PowerPoint type thing. I have some notes on here. So hopefully you'll have some questions. I do uh, want to get to questions at the end and answer as many of them as I can uh, if Tom and Craig are not able to, to do so as we go. But um, 
I'm excited to be here. So we're talking about acting. Um, my bachelor's degree, just really quickly, is from is in acting from uh, California State University School in Central California, uh, and I have a master's degree in MFA in directing. Um, I've I was based in Chicago for a long time before moving to Des Moines. So I um, lived in Chicago proper, and I was a working actor. I had a, an agent, multiple agents, technically while I was there, and uh, did a national commercial, some regional commercials and short films and a lot of work on stage. Primarily most of what I did was on stage and worked at some major theaters, including Looking Glass Theater Company, David, uh, David Schwimmer's Theater Company downtown there. And so a lot of cool stuff. I've trained with Steppenwolf, the second city, Shakespeare and Company. Um, and my goal as a teacher of acting is always to make sure everything is very practical and to try to make acting as objective as possible. And I know that in this subjective field that can be hard, but I'm going to go through some of the tools and, and things that I talk about when, when I approach acting training. And I'm going to try to make sure that these tools can be as objective as possible. So hopefully you can take these and use them as, um, as judges and critics. And, and, and hopefully these terms will give you some, some really tangible things to grab onto. So yeah, I use a definition for acting. I know some of you may not, and I know that many of you probably disagree with my definition of acting. Uh, I like this one for a few reasons. So I'm sure many of you are aware of Sanford Meisner. I don't necessarily teach um, Meisner training in classwork, but this definition I feel like really encompasses what, what we're talking about with acting in terms of truthful behavior in imaginary circumstances. Most of the time people take my class and and they say that acting is becoming the character. Um, and and I, I really like to caution students as often as possible from uh, becoming anyone else. I think that while acting and art can be therapeutic, it is not therapy. So um, in order to keep things objective, I, I really do feel like this is useful. And imaginary circumstances for me is something that I'm going to come back to a lot in, in the course of, of our discussion about acting today because we have fewer circumstances when we're, when we're judging acting. There's, uh, there's no full set, there's no lights. Sometimes we're in a, um, you know, a, a, a big ballroom in a hotel or uh, a classroom on a campus. You know? So the imaginary circumstances really vary. And so our job as, as an adjudicator, as a, a judge, and in my opinion, is to, um, is to find ways to uh, commit to, to willingly suspend our disbelief as an audience member for, for the young people who are performing. So the, the initial question that usually comes up is what makes for truth, the truthful behavior in imaginary circumstances. Um, and, and for me, a lot of this for truthfulness is important that we try to stay in the moment because as an actor, you know the end of the play. Um, I'm going to stop sharing briefly because you all can see this stuff, but I want to help and talk. I want to talk to you all, even though I can't see you. Um, so what, what makes for truth, right? So when I'm talking about staying in the moment, we all know the end of the play as an actor, even as an audience member, we might know how Hamlet ends or, um, you know, as, as a judge in particular, many of you probably know the material that you're watching in some way, shape or form. Um, so staying in the moment is, for me, there's a, a lot of tangible objective tools that we can use. Um, it's really important. I'm, I'm not very good at multitasking. Uh, the young people of our world are much better at multitasking than I am, I find. But my inability to multitask, I think, helps me become a better actor in that. Uh, I can play a single action at a time with a single objective in mind. Um, and I have more information about objectives that we'll get to in a minute, but the goal is to kind of stay off the fence, right? We're in theater, in acting. Um, I, as an adjudicator or an actor, I'm looking for moments that are, are really clear and really dynamic. And that's what I'll come back to in terms of storytelling for acting um, all, all throughout this is clear and dynamic because we need the story, but we also want that story to surprise us or make us feel things as an audience, right? So, if we stay off the fence, then we're able to have clear dynamic choices as actors. Um, when you're on the fence, and I'm talking about that meta metaphor of straddling the fence, right? Like I, I wanna 
play it safe and, and cover all my bases. When we do that, then, then we are susceptible to not making a dynamic choice. Um, as actors, rehearsal is important because those are the moments we put our foot in our mouth and learn about the, the show and the, and the character and all that. Now, just because I'm playing one action at a time, it doesn't mean that I can't vary my tactics. I'm gonna talk about living truthfully a bit here. Tactics can and should vary throughout a performance. Um, and so it's, it's crucial that, um, that you're responding. And I believe that acting happens from your gut, from impulses. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit as well. I also think that it's important to find a useful moment before. So uh, I, I use an example throughout all of my courses and I'll use it today as well. Um, you know, let's imagine that there's a scene and let's say I'm an actor in that scene. It's a two person scene and it's a breakup scene. Um, if I am the person who's coming home and I don't know that I'm gonna be broken up with, my, my scene partner is gonna break up with me. Uh, I, I want to find a moment before that's going to allow for um, dynamic acting, clear and dynamic acting. And, and that moment before um, needs to be useful. So if it's a breakup scene and I don't know I'm going to be broken up with, a lot of times I'll say, hey, everybody, you know, what, what would you want to think about before you come in? What's your moment before? And this is at the very beginning of class usually. And students will say something like, well, you know, I want to think about something sad or I'm, I want to, I want to have a, you know, like a, I want to think that, I had a really rough day or, and what I was, what I, what I would propose, what I do propose to students is that your moment before should actually probably be the opposite. In order to stay in the moment, you need to have an objective and you actually want to start from a place that will allow for a dynamic change for contrast. So what I always tell people is I imagine before I start the scene that my moment before is I'm going to propose, uh, propose marriage. And I had a great day. And I had a student back in the summer of like 2013 in Chicago who, who suggested maybe I should have a mariachi band before I knock on the, on the door. I'm gonna propose marriage with a mariachi band. Why not, right? Um, and part of what I'll talk about is, is shooting for the moon when it comes to objective. And that's something I'll come back to in a minute as well. But back to the old screen sharing where we were here. So find a useful moment before. And so this dynamic choice of essentially the opposite of what the scene is about will allow me to stay in the moment if I can commit to those imaginary circumstances. So again, coming back to that idea of truthful behavior in imaginary circumstances. The other thing that I think is super important for truthful behavior, what is truthful is presence. Um, I know that Presence is a tricky thing. So you can see the, the third sub bullet point there, the second circle, that's a book by Patsy Rodenberg. Um, her work is, is fascinating to me. And so presence, what is presence? And this is something that I am constantly evaluating. Um, apologies to all past and future students. I, I, am, I am constantly, uh, whether the class is an acting class or not, sort of engaging in the presence of, of people that I'm around. I think that acting training happens 24-7. Um, obviously, you have to shut it off sometimes for your own mental health, but uh, presence is fascinating to me. Um, the second circle, the idea there is that uh, the goal is to be in, Patsy Rodenberg believes there are three circles. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I believe this as as fully as, as her book might imply, but I, I do think that it's important to know um, generally, this, this concept generally is, is useful in that one of the three circles is, is more of an introverted way of being engaging in a moment. And again, I'm, we're applying this to acting, not real life. Um, but this idea that uh, you could be too introverted on stage and not giving enough energy or uh, action because acting is doing, right? It's not, uh, acting is not passive. It is active, as the term might imply. Uh, I always tell students that the, the first day of class, you know, drama, the term drama comes from the, the Greek term dran, to do something. It is, it is literally entirely active. And so that's what we, as actors, need to provide. Uh, and then, so then the opposite of that introverted is to be overly extroverted, which is what I'm doing right now in, in some way, shape or form, because I'm forced to by Zoom, because uh, I'm on the presenter mode here. But 
the other, the opposite is, is giving too much, doing too much. And so the second circle is that safe, not safe. It's that, that medium place in the middle where you are giving and receiving as equally as possible with all of your, your peers on stage. So I have a question for all of you. Obviously, is there a such thing as the it factor? You've been staring at that question while I talk. Um, sorry to leave you on that screen. I can exit the sharing mode for a second again. Um, is there a such thing as the it factor? Yes, there is. I think we all kind of know that, right? Like I, I have friends who I call them a party in a box because they are always on. They are always so present, listening and giving that when you're in a social event with them, they have it. They have that magnetic quality that draws, draws you in. But that doesn't mean that they're the only ones that do. There are a lot of people who are incredibly introverted in real life that are entirely magnetic as actors, right? Um, and how we talk about this magnetism is I think one of the things that is a problem in theater and in acting in that we don't know how to talk about, you know, well, this person just drew me into their performance. And, and what I would argue is what draws you in is presence. The other thing that draws you in is metaphysics. I, I, and we're not gonna talk about metaphysics today. It's, it's something you have to try to experience in my, in, in my experience of teaching it. Um, but presence is, is really about the give and take. And so when I'm watching acting, um, uh, an actor can be incredibly present or a group of actors can be incredibly present uh, if they're engaged in that second circle with each other, with full body listening is the other part of this that I, I have referenced on the, the slideshow here, right? Um, and a lot of that is really about eye contact, right? So when I'm watching actors, are they actually making eye contact with each other? Are they fully present with each other? And are they listening with more than just their ears, right? Because we can um, listen with our feelers, right? When the little hairs on our skin pop up, um, we sense something, we feel something. And in fact, as an audience member, those are the moments we are hoping for. We're hoping that a, a, a playwright and a director and performers and designers can craft moments where we go, whoa. When we watch uh, performers at, at speech um, in Iowa, we, we're hoping for these moments that make our, our hair stand on our skin. And, and that's presence. That's about eye contact, uh, vulnerability, uh, and metaphysics, actual sharing of energy with each other uh, and the audience at the same time. So. So is there an it factor? Yes. Uh, can you, as uh, can we, can any of us have presence? Absolutely. You can train in that way and learn it. And that's one thing I'm looking for. So when I'm judging, I'm like watching for moments that surprise me, uh, that make my hair stand up, that, that are other actors being present with each other. And I think finding a way to be, um, to put a term to it, to say, hey, look, y'all were very present with each other uh, is a much more tangible or objective way to, to describe that it factor or that feeling that we get, right? So, so that's something that I find really useful uh, and talk about in all of my classes, but especially, especially in acting. So um, that's, that's an, an important factor for truth. Um, so look, people come into acting one and they're, they're like, hey, Carl, um, you, can you teach me to cry? on cue. It'll help me get out of my, my speeding tickets and it'll, you know, and I, I, I tell them, sure I can, you know, buy a little container of Visine, keep it in your pocket, uh, distract the person that's talking to you, put some Visine drops in your eye and blink a lot. That's, that's how I can teach you to cry. Um, I cannot, I don't have tricks for, for faking emotion. And in fact, I don't find faked emotion to be, uh, engaging or interesting or dynamic or clear. It, it in fact draws me out of, of any performance. And so I believe fully that emotion is a byproduct on stage. Um, now, emotion as a byproduct, again, this gets into that tricky territory. I do not teach method acting. I don't endorse method acting. I think it can be very unhealthy. Um, and so, how then do we find emotion as a byproduct if we don't believe what's happening? If, and frankly, we can imagine anything. Our imagination is, is incredibly strong. 
Um, and we wouldn't be interested in acting if, if, if it wasn't. Um, so we, how do we find emotion as a byproduct? And so a big part of what I'm, I'm interested in when I watch acting, when I'm adjudicating acting, is emotion as a byproduct. And so in order for uh, an actor to find emotion as a byproduct, the, the goal is to engage with a single objective until that objective must change. Uh, technically speaking, um, in, as a, a working actor, I would have called that a beat change, right? So like whenever I can't get what I want or I realize I need to try to get something else or I do get what I want, I need a new objective. I'm always pursuing an objective. My objective um, is, is gonna be, we're gonna talk about objective in a minute, but it's, a, it's crucial that it's really clear and specific. Um, anyway, so emotion as a byproduct, if I'm trying to get what I want, when I don't get it, then I, there, I have a chance to receive emotion as a byproduct. Uh, invent nothing, deny nothing is a phrase that some of you may hate, I'm sorry to say, but I, I do think it's interesting to, to note what we're feeling, right? Like, if I'm inventing a feeling, or if an actor on stage is inventing a feeling, the, as an audience member, I'm going to see that. As an adjudicator, I'm going to see the, the invention. And again, this is a way for me to objectively say, you know, the, the emotion felt invented. It felt that you created it, as opposed to just denying what you were actually feeling. Because even though that emotion might have been less dynamic, the story probably would have been more clear, and the acting probably would have been more dynamic if we just acknowledged what we were actually feeling. Uh, the sort of next level, um, the sort of next level thing in terms of emotion as a byproduct is fighting against emotion, which I'm not really going to talk about today. But when you really get to the point where you're seeing really strong young actors, they're not only feeling emotion as a byproduct. Uh, I feel bad just leaving this screen up. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, they're not only feeling emotion as a, a byproduct, but they're also fighting against that emotion, right? So like if you're watching some acting and, and someone is actually is crying, um, you as an audience member, if you're connected to that actor in some way, if you know them in some way, or if you've found a way to really invest in that character, which isn't always the case at IHSSA, um, you, you might cry, but the reality is, is if someone's crying, we usually go to comfort. That's our like typical response, like emotionally. We don't typically cry with them. Some people do, it depends on how empathetic you are naturally as a human. Um, but generally speaking, right, if someone else is crying, we don't necessarily cry. And that's true of storytelling and acting as well. Uh, if, if a comedian tells a joke and then laughs really hard at their own joke, do you have to laugh at it? Uh, unless the joke is really good, you probably won't, right? So fighting against emotion is the next step. But that doesn't count unless you're able to have emotion as a byproduct, right? Um, when I would, uh, what I would contend is that um, when I, as an actor, am crying, if I'm trying to stop myself from crying, you're actually going to cry more. Uh, I did a production of Tuesdays with Maury, and at the end of the play, I'd cross downstage, and I, I would be crying a lot, and I had to deliver that last monologue to the audience, and I would, I would try to stop crying. I usually couldn't, and that you know, and that made for a different effect for the audience. Uh, in my opinion, a more impactful emotional connection event for the audience. Anyway, so the, the big thing here is removing tensions that inhibit truthful responses, which we obviously can't do as, as judges, but we can say we see that we see, uh, I, I could say to an actor, I see that you have an emotional response to the material in a very imaginative circumstance way that seems healthy, but you're holding it back because you are naturally trying to prevent that feeling from coming up. That's what we do, right? Um, my daughter used to watch a lot of Daniel Tiger. And I don't know if you have kids or, or babysit or, or whatever, but uh, I can't see any of you. So I have no idea what the demographics are here, but um, you know, Daniel Tiger says, you know, if you feel angry, stomp three times or, or roar or all these tools that are super important for real life social uh, behavior. They're crucial, actually. And, but the reality is, is acting is about not using any of Daniel Tiger's songs. Uh, we actually need the opposite. We need to feel whatever feelings we're feeling. Uh, Dave Rosowski says, feel the feelings you're feeling the moment you feel the feelings. Um, because that, that is truthful. That's the emotion that's coming up as a byproduct. So we can say as, a, as an adjudicator, adjudicator or a judge, you know, I, I sense that you have a lot of emotion as a byproduct, but uh, you're not letting it out. You know? So 
and, and this is a fine line to walk because we need to make sure we're telling young people that in real life, in your social interactions day to day, you don't necessarily want to yell full out at someone else. You don't necessarily want to show all of your uh, deepest fears or, or sadness. But on stage, you do, you do need to have access to that emotion that you might be feeling as a byproduct if the emotion you're feeling is connected to those emer imaginary circumstances. Um, the other thing that's on this last slide that we were talking about is, is talking about acting from the gut, an intuitive performance. So this is like maybe my opinion, and I, I don't mean to impress my opinions upon you, but in my opinion, the best acting is not, doesn't come from up here, from your head, it comes from your gut. And I, I specifically say gut as opposed to heart or anything else, uh, A, because I believe in impulses and intuition, and B, because I believe impulses are connected to breath. Uh, if you were to walk to your home, you're probably all in your homes, thank you, 2020. Uh, but if you were to walk into your home and come to the front door, and if you were to open the front door, and this is maybe even more impactful think, because of 2020, but if you open your front door and 20 or 30 of your closest friends and family yelled surprise, you as a human would go, oh, and you would breathe in that that impulse, that feeling of like, wow, all these people are here to surprise me for my birthday or a holiday or a congratulatory experience, whatever it is. But that's impulse is connected to breath. So when you're talking to, to young actors who, are, who seem to be having a, a, a heady performance, a, a thought out or a planned performance that's less in the moment, uh, truthful in the moment, one thing that you can come back to is, is are your impulses connected to breath? Uh, a lot of times what I'll say is, um, you know, you exhaled an impulse. So some, uh, a colleague, another actor on stage might do something really impactful and I might go, ah, just like that moment of surprise at the birthday party. And then I might go, ah, and then say my line back, which is something we would actually do in real life because we don't necessarily want to show that emotion. Think of that surprise party. You might want to look cool. You might say, thanks, I, yeah, I knew this was coming, <laughs> you know, but that, that's not truthful, really. That's not what you're feeling because, and you have an objective as a human being, you're trying to, to stop that feeling. But on stage, uh, the, the essential, the basics, the fundamental tools of an actor are to say, wow, you know, like, a, I don't want to yell because I don't know how close my mic is to my mouth and I don't want to blow out eardrums, but you could, you would almost yell with joy. Thank you, you know? Um, and so impulses are connected to, to breath. Reactive acting it still needs to be connected to objective, um, but it is connected to breath and impulses. And that's why I talk about acting from the gut. Whether you want to consider acting from the heart or whatever that might be, an actual tangible objective tool that you can use is this idea that you could be acting from, from your gut. What, what are, did you feel an impulse and, and did you actually respond with that impulse fully, uh, fully there? So that's another thing that I find really useful uh, when I am adjudicating. I'll go back to my slides. We're at the same place we were before. You didn't miss anything. Um, so impulses are connected to breath. All right. So the big three, all of you know these, I'm, I'm fairly certain. I just want to throw in these interchangeable terms um, because the, one of the real challenges of adjudicating acting or teaching acting is, is everybody uses a different term. Uh, even the term beat change that I threw out a little bit ago, um, people don't all use that. You know, what is a beat? Is, is it a small pause that a playwright has intended you to take, or is it a section of a play that an actor uses for analysis? There's a lot of interchangeable terms. The, the big three are the ones I feel like you're probably going to encounter the most. Um, action, objective, and obstacle are those big three. Uh, again, I think all of you probably know this, but um, terms that I've in, encountered as an educator and as an actor, uh, actions are interchangeable with tactics and tools. I find tools incredibly useful um, because they allow for more wiggle room. So what I teach when I teach tools is, is this idea of tools as metaphors. So I imagine, uh, I'm going to come back to me so you can see me just gesticulate wildly. Uh, 
So these tools, uh, I imagine I have a tool belt on as an actor, right? So like I can have a tool that is like the sledgehammer and I'm, the line might be, I love you. I might say, I love you to the other character. And I can, I can sledgehammer that line. I love you. Or I could tweeze that line, right? Um, I love you. And, and what I like about the idea of a metaphorical tool is, uh, sorry that I just said I love you to all of you. That was not necessarily how I intended for that to go. That's the phrase that came to mind. Uh, but the, the tools that I'm thinking about, when they're metaphors, it, I, I have leeway for it to be unique and different every time. Um, and, and so that's another thing, right? This idea of a metaphor. And it, it does make things, it can be a little more cloudy, but it, it also can be more sp specific. Um, William Ball, the, the director says that limitation is the springboard to creativity, right? So this idea that I'm gonna tweeze this line and, and tools can fall into two basic categories, to push and to, and to pull. Um, and so the sledgehammer is a pushing and the tweezing is a pulling. Um, but, and, and this is an easy way to vary tactics too. So like I can score my script and say, oh, look, you know, I'm going to tweeze here or sledgehammer there. And how I sledgehammer and tweeze is going to be wildly different still. So it allows for more acting from the gut as opposed to acting from the head. Uh, anyway, that's kind of a, a, a side, you know, tangent. But you can use these terms with, you know, with actors that you're, you're responding to, right? Uh, you know, you, I didn't feel, feel like you varied your tactics enough. And if, if they give you a quizzical look, you can say, you know, you, you could use more tools, you could play more actions, right? Like these interchangeable terms, who knows what their coach uses. Um, so it's nice to know some of these interchangeable terms. Objective, uh, what do you want is the phrase that people use a lot. Um, I love the phrase fighting for. What are you fighting for? Because it's more active. Um, it has a little bit of a negative connotation. Uh, it's not in my muscle memory. I use objective and want more more frequently, but I, I love that interchangeable term of fighting for. Um, we're going to talk about objective in a second here. And then this last thing on this slide, I guess I can show that to you again. Um, this last thing on this slide is this idea of, of obstacle. And what I have, you know, there's not a whole lot of interchangeable terms for obstacles, uh, things that get in the way, things that prevent you from getting your objective but what I like to, to emphasize here is that there's an opportunity for discovery. Discoveries allow us to stay in the moment. Uh, I, I always tell students discoveries were meant to be discovered. Anything in a script that could potentially be a discovery, something that the character didn't already know, allows you to stay in the moment. And that's something you can tell, uh, to tell a young person that you're, you're watching act, right? You can say to them, uh, you know, there, there's more opportunities for discovery uh, in, in this scene or this script, you know, that, that, that moment that you, um, uh, where you said, you know, what do you, what do you mean I'm not tall enough for you? You could have discovered that you weren't tall enough for that person in that moment, as opposed to asking that question rhetorically, right? So always ask the question, always find the opportunities for discoveries. Normally I would say, stop and ask questions. We're going to do them at the end. My muscle memory was leading me right to pausing. Uh, so I believe there are four or five, there should be five, sorry, tenants of objectives. Uh, I don't know why I didn't, maybe I deleted the fifth one. Anyway, uh, first of all, it should be something the other actor can do. I'm going to spend some time talking about that one in particular. Should be a positive choice. Uh, we can't judge the characters we're playing. And that's something you can tell a young person. You know, it seemed to me that you're judging the character you're making. And I, I knew that because the choices you were making seemed negative as opposed to positive. Uh, your, your objective should be fun to do. Um, we all know that it's called a play for a reason, right? So like we can see, we can feel and sense whether or not an actor is having fun on stage. Your objective should also be specific. That's the one that got deleted. Uh, if it's not specific, then you're gonna be too much on the fence. And lastly, it should shoot for the moon and that's gonna allow for emotion as a byproduct. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in part because I'm embarrassed that I don't have that fifth tenant. Uh, um, I, I don't know if that joke landed because I can't see any of you. Anyway, so when I talk about objective, I always come back to that same example. 
two actors, two characters, and, and they're about to play a breakup scene. I'm the actor that comes into the room that doesn't know that I'm about to be broken up with. My moment before is I'm gonna propose. I, I have the engagement ring and I have a mariachi band and I'm ready to propose. Um, so I need an objective, right? Uh, and the objective that I use, I use it all the time in my classes, uh, is I want the other actor to jump in the air like a starfish and say yes with a high pitched voice. I know that sounds super random. I want the other actor to jump in the air like a starfish and say yes with a high pitched voice. When I teach acting with deaf students and the ASL interpreters are trying to sign that, they, they get really frustrated with me because that's a hard thing to sign. Uh, so we have to stop and break it down. But anyway, um, I want the other actor to, I want the other actor to do something. Uh, it, it's a positive thing I want them to do, jump in the air and, like a starfish and say yes with a high pitched voice. It's fun for me to try to get them to do that. I want them to jump in the air like a starfish. That's a fun thing for me to try to get them to do. Uh, it is very specific, um, arguably over specific, and it definitely shoots for the moon because if that other actor does not know what my objective is, to jump in the air like a starfish and say yes with a high pitched voice, uh, are they gonna do it? No, absolutely, absolutely not. I would never jump in the air like a starfish and say yes with a high pitched voice. Unless some, uh, maybe there's a slight chance, one in a thousand, that if I didn't know that my, uh, the, the actor who I was acting with wanted me to do that, maybe one in a thousand times I'd actually do that. So why does that matter? So the specificity gets me off the fence. The positive choice and the fun to do uh, allows for me to, to exhibit presence and joy. Um, if it's something the other actor can do, if they have to do it. I don't want them to, uh, to say yes. It's too general. Uh, that could be anything. I could respond yes. I could say, you know, someone, the, an actor could say to me, will you marry me? And I could be like, yes, right? It, it doesn't mean enough. Um, uh, they could, they could, I could have them um, do anything, but it, if it's about what they do. And I don't want them to feel love, right? How do I know? Uh, if they feel love, right? It has to be something they can do. Characters, just like people, lie. So action is what matters. And so when you're adjudicating, it always comes back to action. What are, the, what are, we, what are you doing? What were you doing in any of these moments, right? So this idea that the objective shoots for the moon and is something the other actor can do, when the other actor doesn't jump in the air like a starfish and say yes with a high-pitched voice, I will vary my tactics so that my performance is more dynamic. And I will feel emotion as a byproduct. We usually do a little bit of viewpoints in my acting classes, um, very little in acting one. But one thing I make people do is, is this exercise where they try to make a triangle with partners and they, they don't know who their partner is. And uh, so they end up trying to make this equilateral triangle uh, and, and, and they fail. They can't do it um, because they don't know who their partner is and they're not allowed to, to, to verbally communicate with each other. Um, and they get frustrated and they quit usually, uh, or they cheat and make the equilateral triangles and get it over with. But they're all feeling something. They're feeling embarrassment or frustration or, and I'm like, hey, why, are, why do you feel feelings right now? We were just trying to make a triangle. You know what I mean? So it, it all comes back to this really simple idea of having a clear objective uh, and, then, and, then, and then what the response is. Thank you, 10. Uh, I got a chat. I don't think you all could see that. Thanks. Thank you, Ten Tom. Um, so, so the, that that idea of objective, these tenants, are things you can come back to when you're talking to to young people. And I think I think they're hopefully more objective and clear in terms of those five tenants and how 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 they could be discussed. Uh, I don't know how many slides I have left. Oh, not very many. I'm I'm in good shape, Tom. No stress. I could go on forever, but I won't. Um, so, how does this apply to IHSSA, um, I've got some notes here. These are kind of mostly for me, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again. Um, but you know, we can come back to them and, and see them. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, so any of these terms that we've discussed could be used. I, I do have these terms on like a, a what I call a one sheet. Um, it's one page front and back. And I'll send that to Tom and, and to Craig, and they can make that available if you want to reference this stuff again in the future. Um, but these terms obviously can come back to, and they're hopefully they're objective terms that you can really, you know, 
be starters. As an adjudicator, I don't always know what I'm going to talk about. You know, I, I, they finish and it's my turn to talk. And, um, you know, I, I try to jump on to one of these things that stood out to me the most. And I might not know exactly how it stood out to me. And the other thing I like to do as a director and as a, a respondent is, is I ask questions. You know, I'll say, you know, what was going on in that moment or, or why is this happening this way? And, and I will ask the young people questions. Um, on my next slide, which you're not really gonna, you don't see anyways right now. Um, you know, in some way, shape or form, I, I want to, to disarm the young people, um, not in a negative way, in a really positive way. Uh, I, I just, I, I find that um, it's important to, I, so for example, uh, I have a really vivid memory of, of watching a piece in ensemble acting. And when I watch, I try to watch as an audience member. It, it's a tough thing to do for me because I'm not good at multitasking, but I'm taking notes very meticulously in terms of object, objective things I'm seeing, but I'm also trying to imagine or connect with the story as an audience member as much as possible. And there was a performance where a young person was, was I, felt, I felt very present and vulnerable. And when they finished, I walked up and I was like, I feel like I need to give you a hug. Uh, and, and the poor young guy, he, he was like, blah, and that was obviously pre COVID. We're not going to be hugging people for a while, I think, but, um, the poor young person was like, well, we don't, uh, and you know, he came up to me after at the end of the day and was like, I'm really sorry. I reacted that way. I didn't think you were going to say that. Uh, and I didn't know I was going to say that either. Right. But, um, I, I like to try to find ways to uh, make actors listen, you know, they're on a euphoric sort of level. So asking questions, responding as an audience member. Sometimes I'll be like, where is your coach? Uh, I, this, just this past year, I was like, how does this story end? You know, it's kind of an open-ended ending. Where's your coach? Tell me what happens next. Uh, and the coach was like, I don't know. Um, and it was a really engaging, charming story. And, and it was great that the, the coach didn't know. It didn't matter. It wasn't part of the, the context. Anyway, um, I'm an audience member and I'm trying to, to find ways to talk to young people that that make them feel like they're part of the response. Um, and what's important within this is there are imaginary circumstances that are unique to IHSSA. Uh, you know, like as, as a critic, um, I need to try to jump into those imaginary circumstances of the performance as quickly as possible. I need to try to, I don't wanna to try to figure it out, but I need to be totally open-minded about what the world of the play or the world of the story could be. Um, I, I'm, always coming back to this idea that acting is doing. So is it active? Are there things that I can talk about that are more active or less active? Um, I believe that consistency is the death of good acting. That's a whole chapter from Michael Shirtliff's book, Audition, that one sentence. Um, and adjudicating acting is similar. Even though I might not know exactly what I'm gonna say when I start, if I know what I'm gonna say, I'm probably planning too much and I'm probably being too consistent in my responses. So. Um, you know, I want to be inconsistent in that I'm always talking to groups of people about whatever I actually saw uh, to keep it as objective as possible. And then lastly is the, is the um, performance dynamic. Um, are the hairs standing up on, on my arm? Um, and I think a lot of dynamic performance comes from contrast. Uh, we can come back to this idea that, um, you know, I, I'm going to propose marriage with a mariachi band and then I get told I'm going to uh, be broken up with. Um, and, and that's contrast, right? And dynamic, you know, so where are there moments of, of contrast, high contrast or dynamic choices? Something that is surprising that you almost expected. That it makes sense in the story, but it's surprising anyways. Um, so those are, that's kind of what I have. I could go on for a lot longer, but I don't want to, I would love to answer questions. I, I do have my, uh, you don't need this. You, uh, um, my last slide is, is boring. I'm not going to show it. What questions do you have? What can I answer or, or articulate more about Craig? Do you need me to talk more specifically about, um, uh, how I adjudicate I kind of smashed acting and adjudicating together? You know, I, I really like uh, what you've mentioned, Carl, and somebody mentions the idea about being open-minded. Is it truly important for us as people? Also, don't plan out your responses. 
make sure your responses are to the moment and mm -hmm. you know the importance of that and i love some of that terminology and we will post those terms when you get that to us but be different in the activity uh, be different as an adjudicator in other words you know find the difference each time and uh i think those are wonderful ideas tom uh, i think there's some questions you want to moderate us through some Sure, Craig. Yeah, absolutely. Carl, thank you again for a wonderful way to kick us off this morning. Um, I'm sure you have the Q&A open as well on your screen. We can kind of go through those, but I'm going to moderate these so everyone is uh, able to see them if they're not able to see them on their screen. But I uh, just wanted to recount the author's name of the book you had mentioned early on in your presentation. I believe it was Patsy Rodenberg, but can you confirm that? that that's correct. Patsy Rodenberg, she has some voice acting books as well, but The Second Circle. And, and you know, I, I, the document that I'm going to send to Craig and, and, and Tom has I have that listed there for you. So you'll be able to access that document. Fantastic. Our next question um, is from a coach and they're curious, what is the process for matching material with a student? That's so hard, right? Um, so in my experience and in my opinion, uh, as an actor, I can do just about anything, right? As long as I can commit to the imaginary circumstances. So that's a really, really great question. Um, I don't know, you know, like it's going to vary from school to school and coach to coach. What I would suggest is, is don't get hung up in matching material to students. Um, try to find something that you think that they'll enjoy performing and, uh, and connect to and invest in, in a, a safe and healthy way. And then, and then let the chips fall where they might, you know, all of us could perform a role and we would do it very differently and it would still be incredibly effective. So uh, the less we plan, the more effective our choices can become if we're really open-minded and in the moment and, and engaging with what we see, with what's tangible and objective, and, and then directing and coaching from there. Our next question is in relation to the Meisner technique that you discussed. You mentioned a lot about the other actor that is centered in the Meisner technique. How does this work in individual acting categories? How do they use the text to build other people? That's an awesome question. Um, yes, so we we actually we actually spend a lot of time in acting. I have a whole class for auditioning where we sit and we we talk to imaginary people all the time. Uh, so in those individual events, that other actor still is. It's really important that you have an objective, something that they can do. You do have to put in the extra time to imagine what their what their response is so i do a monologue i have done a monologue for a, a long time i got a lot of work from it and the first line is i want to give you a bath that's the first line uh and and yeah. so i have spent a lot of time crafting that that other actor's response and so you know i, I want to give you a bath <laughs> and then i respond and i imagine that they have had um a face of like excuse me, what did you just say to me? And so I'm building in their response, but I'm still trying to attach my first line to objective, my shoot for the moon specific objective of I want them to like run to the bathtub and, you know, jump in without with their clothes on, whatever it is, right? So you do have to build in more time to, to put their response, but it's still all of this still works the same way. Uh, and and it, it, I wouldn't worry too much. Get, don't get hung up on Sanford Meisner because again, I love the quote, uh, Meisner training is very specific. It works for some people, it doesn't work for others. Staying on solo acting really quick. Um, in solo acting, is the actor encouraged to interact with the judge audience as a choice? Uh, that's, look, the judge, th that's two separate questions for me. In my opinion, um, there is no fourth wall. The fourth wall is a, a thing that started being used in uh, a lot in the late 1800s. It's only 140 years old in terms of like really consistent use. Um, I don't care about the fourth wall and because the vast majority of theater doesn't use it. So if you want to talk to the audience, I think that's great. There are times where I am interacted with as a judge. There are a few occasions where it works. Um, in, I. I can't help but think of it as a training moment for a young person who wants to be an actor. I know not all of our, our young people want to be actors, but it, it is a huge no-no to act to the casting director. They should, be, they should feel totally free and confident to take notes. And so in terms of the long-term training, I would, I would always caution against 
uh, performing to the judge in particular. Um, but you know, there are there are times where uh, a young person has performed right to me, and it was incredibly engaging and fun. So you know, there's a the every rule was meant to be broken, but generally speaking, I would caution against performing to the judge. But the audience, go for it. Well, if you wouldn't mind just recounting the five tenets again for the first yeah, time. yep, and this will be in the document as well. But the, the it should be some, your objective should be something that the other actor can do, actually do. Uh, it should be specific. Um, it should be positive, a positive choice, as opposed to like, I want them to fall down and break their legs. That's not positive. Uh, it should be fun to do. It's, I see it over there. And it, um, and it should be, so you should shoot for the moon. No sense in aiming low. Uh, this next question is in relation to breathing exercises, or do you have any resources for breathing exercises or how to work with breath? Yeah, you know, I, my training is all in Linklater. I teach Linklater. Um, it, breathing is hard to teach. Uh, we, yes, Kristen Linklater's book, Freeing the Natural Voice, is, is my go-to. Uh, that wasn't on my, my one sheet, but I can add that before I send it. Um, that's like a whole nother seminar. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to answer that briefly. Essentially, the goal is to, to breathe to your center as often as possible. So you have, because because you have access to emotion in your core and your center. And I'll just ask this question here for you, Carl. Um, will you be able to share your slide deck with Craig and myself to post? Is that something you'd be willing to do? Yeah, I can send the, the slideshow. The slideshow is copied and pasted essentially from that one sheet. So I think the one sheet will have, I see the question here, can you show the slide what makes truth again? And I, that's on the one sheet. So that the, accessing the document is probably a little easier than the slideshow, but I'll have that info for everybody for sure. Perfect. Well, we had no other questions at this time. So I want to be respectful for everyone's time. I want to be respectful for your time, Carl. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Very informative. We've had a lot of good response here, as I'm sure you've seen as well. Uh, for folks who've learned a lot from your presentation. So thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. It was, it's an honor to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. It was wonderful to have you with us today. We are thrilled. Okay, now since this was uh, the judge certification weekend, about now you'd be going and buy, getting more of these packaged ideas to take into Sue Danielson's presentation. And now it's my opportunity to introduce to you Sue Danielson. And this is a name that we all know and love. <laughs> this uh, woman has been with us in Iowa for years. And we say that with great affection, Sue. Um, Sue is the Assistant News Director for iHeartMedia. And also we've heard her on WHO reaccounting numerous things for years. Uh, she's from Illinois, but again, she saw the light and she moved to <laughs> Iowa, which we love. Also, a neat thing about Sue is that she is an Edward R. Murrow Award winner for her broadcasting and reporting, uh, which is a, an incredible prestigious honor. And also, Sue has been a multiple all-state critic with this. And without further ado, I give you the wonderful oh Sue Danielson. <laughs> what a buildup. Thank you very much, Craig. <laughs> That was fantastic. Oh, well, good, good, good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I, I, um, I've worked at WHO Radio, as, as Craig said, for quite a long time as an anchor reporter, uh, more than 30 years, actually, 31 years, so a very long time. I started when I was, I don't know, like uh, 10 or 11, I think, yeah, pretty young. But uh, I've been gathering and writing broadcasting news and public affairs programming. Um, and as Craig said, I've been a critic for all state uh, speech festival several times and have really enjoyed uh, meeting the students, uh, participating in this activity. And then Craig has asked me to share uh, some tips uh, for you as you're uh, doing uh, critiquing um, and maybe some coaches that are out there too. Hopefully some of my suggestions are applicable to students taking on not only this event, but maybe other events as well. So. Um, I am used to reading from a script. I have to apologize. You're gonna see me looking back and forth a little bit here. Uh, no teleprompter here, so uh, bear with me. And I would like to share a PowerPoint with you. So I, I uh, as I said, I wanna start with a little bit of uh, WHO radio history and my background. Uh, WHO radio is uh, 96 years old. Yeah, a lot of history with this radio station. 
It's been housed in several locations in downtown Des Moines. Um, radio was a huge deal um, back in the early days, and we have a ton of pictures in the archives in the 1930s and 40s especially. But something called the Iowa Barn Dance Frolic, this is from 1952, as you can see. Just kind of a fun picture I thought I'd share with you, um, take you back in time a little bit. This was big entertainment uh, back before Netflix and internet <laughs> and television. Um, these performers would travel all over the country to perform on radio stations like WHO and, and WLS in Chicago, and, and uh, some of them would be based here, some of them would just travel all over the place, all over the country, and this was, this is big time entertainment, and so these pictures just kind of take you back into a different era of radio, and things have changed a lot, of course, since then. Um, one of our most famous uh, employees uh, was a sports reporter uh, by the name of Ronald Reagan. Of course, he would become to go on to be, be an actor in California and then eventually president decades later. Um, you also may have heard of um, a newsman by the name of Jack Shelley. Uh, he was also a, a very big figure in, in our business of radio news um, in the state of Iowa. He won wide acclaim as a correspondent for World War II and then went on to be a professor at Iowa State University and has just uh, taught many, many students um, over the years, uh, passed away several years ago. But, but um, he was a real special person in our, in our business in the state of Iowa, an interesting history. Uh, during my time here at WHO Radio, I've noticed that many of those who are attracted to radio news um, or sports or farm broadcasting, are, they're fascinated by current events, obviously, and they're curious. But there's also this little performance desire, a little bit of ham in there as well. It's kind of subtle. And you'll notice that with some of your students too. Um, there are some that you know, are, are full into the acting and, and then the others. And in radio news, maybe not so much. They may be a little bit more shy about it. So it's kind of fun to watch them come out of that shyness and, uh, and participate in this activity. Um, a sort of a performance outlet, you know. At WHO Radio Today is owned by iHeart Media. It's a huge corporation. Um, our station in Des Moines is a news talk format, and we do have a mix of local and syndicated talk shows. We have a newsroom, pretty good sized newsroom, with several anchors and reporters, and we do news for Des Moines, but also a number of other cities in Iowa and throughout the Midwest. We're doing some news on Alexa and Google News and other things. So things are really changing quite a bit um, this, in this industry and in news as we kind of evolve and, and roll with the changes. Um, so much of my success in, in my career really can be traced back to uh, my high school speech team experience in Champaign, Illinois. I was recruited, I think I was a sophomore or junior, I was recruited by my speech teacher to be on the speech team. And I was a little hesitant because I didn't know the other kids on the team. They were in theater, I wasn't. Um, I was involved in other stuff. And I soon learned that I was also one of only a handful of girls who competed in radio news in the entire state. Because in Illinois, it's a little different than Iowa. They'd have, well, some similarities. We'd have competitions all over the place. And then, and it would culminate into the state competition. I'm, I'm not sure how they work it now, but I was like the only girl. It was such a weird experience when you're a teen to be in that environment. I was shy, you know, and I, I didn't, I wasn't quite sure, oh, how's this going to work out? And I felt like some of those boys were a little surprised to see me there. And uh, it was kind of fun to exceed their expectations because I'd been practicing and my speech teacher recognized that I had some gift, I guess, uh, to uh, participate in this. And, and I excelled. I did really, really well. So I loved speech team in high school. And I just wanted to share that with you that, you know, it, it does kind of go back and some of those memories in high school will stick with you uh, for a lifetime. Um, the radio news was the only event they let me do, by the way, because I didn't have any talent anywhere else. But it was something that um, I really enjoyed. I went on to college at the University of Illinois and studied a lot of different things. I liked everything, um, but I didn't really know what to focus on. Um, until I wandered into the campus radio station, uh, WPGU, and those call letters, I think, are, you know, stand for Pig University, <laughs> because Illinois is a land-grant university and it had, of course, strong connection to agriculture. But, you know, that radio station was so fun. Uh, I wandered in there and I met these other people, other students. They were so much like me. They loved current events. Um, they were news nerds. And... A lot of them 
had done high school speech in high school, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh, these are my people. I felt right at home. The bells and whistles went on, lights went on, and I realized this is what I want to do for my, my living. This is my calling. Caught that broadcasting bug, been doing it ever since, and uh, got a radio station, a, got a job at a station while I was in college. Um, I did an internship at a radio news network in Los Angeles, which was a real cool experience for a year. And I was out there, you know, enjoying Los Angeles in my 20s. That was fun, fun place to live. Uh, but I got a call one day from a, a colleague uh, or a former student of mine or a classmate of mine in college who was working at a station in Iowa and they had an opening and he recommended me. They needed someone to fill in for an employee who was going on maternity leave. And um, I wanted to get, I like California, it was a lot of fun, but I kind of want to get back to my family in the Midwest. And Iowa was close, cl a lot closer than California. And I also felt like I, I wasn't getting a lot out of my career in a big city, like big market like Los Angeles. And I doubted that I would have that many opportunities there. So I thought I needed to try it out. So I moved to Old Wine, Iowa and uh, an ice storm. <laughs> and it was quite a, it was a culture shock moving from uh, the second largest city in America to Old Wine, Iowa. It's kind of fun where everybody knew your business in Old Wine and everybody welcomed you. And um, everybody was so friendly. And I really, really liked it a lot. And that's probably also what hooked me into staying in Iowa was just the, the neighborly and friendliness and uh, hospitality. I learned so much of that radio station, that small town radio station uh, about news gathering and reporting and writing and editing and doing everything that I, I didn't learn in California. I, had, I didn't have those opportunities, but in Iowa, it was great because everybody, it seemed like everybody knew it. We worked for a news director, a longtime news director by the name of Dick Petrick. And he knew, it's like he could smell news. He knew what was going on all the time. And he had this network of, of contacts. He would get on the phone and call people every morning and try to scare up some story, you know, what's going on. So, so that was a real interesting experience. Um, and I also uh, met my, my husband there. <laughs> so that was another benefit because he was working there at the same time. And um, so that was, uh, that was another major key part about my life. Um, I moved on to WHO radio after KOEL. I was hired on part-time and eventually full-time. And at WHO in Des Moines, I've covered a wide range of stories of crime, politics, severe weather, uh, features, public affairs, co-hosted an afternoon drive program for 15 years. And as Craig said, I'm the assistant news director and I'm still, I'm still covering a wide range of stories and do regular newscasts. So. I, it's a long way of getting around to the point that that high school speech team, that high school speech teacher, you know, that experience really planted a seed and it, it, it kind of paved the way for my future career. I didn't know it when I was a teen, um, but it really made a tremendous impact. And the critics things, the critics words and, and the coaching and all of that made an impact. And the other students made an impact too. You know, they weren't necessarily interested in radio news and you may find that too. You may have some students that are like, oh, I don't know about this you know, let's go watch an acting event or comedy, you know, and, but they started to take notice when I started like doing really well and they realized, oh, oh, they hadn't even thought about radio news. So they were kind of interested in that. But um, so the teachers just sort of had this spooky ability to spot aptitude and talents. And, and uh, sometimes we don't, we don't recognize in them in ourselves. Um, and I kind of denied it too, and then found that campus radio station. So that's the history. That high school coach gave me a lot of pointers. I picked up a lot of others along the way, which may be useful, hopefully, when you work with your students as critics and as uh, coaches and uh, you critique them. So we're going to go through a lot of stuff here in this PowerPoint. Um, this is from the IHSSA. Just contestants are to be judged on content and delivery. Content we judged on selection, editing, and arrangement of material for newsworthiness and effective news presentation. Delivery to be judged on voice quality, vocal rate emphasis, pronunciation, vitality of presentation, and audience appeal. So we're going to go through a number of things. And at the end of my presentation, if we have time, which we probably will, we might go through some wordsmithing ideas um, just to kind of give you an idea of, um, of how we can encourage writing that will be um, easier for the students uh, as they perform in this. So one of the easiest tips I can provide 
um, if you're judging someone and you're writing down on, on the critique sheet, if you hear a student pop the P, they're probably sitting too close to the microphone, okay? It's a super easy tip um, that can help students sound better right away to avoid that. When they speak directly into the microphone and they're doing that, they will pop that P or other uh, consonants will be very sensitive. The microphone is sensitive. So you might want to suggest to the students, if they're doing that and you hear that when they perform, just to have them kind of put it off to the side a little bit so their, their voice is kind of speaking over across the, uh, the top of that microphone, that will limit that annoying sound of popping the P's and it'll make them sound a lot better. And it's just a real quick and easy tip uh, for those students. Um, students have about 30 minutes, I think, to build a newscast when they're competing in this event. They use wire copy that's given to them, what we call just news content. Uh, we used to call it wire copy, that's kind of an outdated term. Um, but it's content that will be given to them and then they will have, as I said, a half an hour to build this newscast. And the performance needs to be between four and five minutes. They get to five, uh, there's a timer who will be with them and they will, um, they'll be holding up flashcards to help them keep track of the time. And the last one says stop and that's, they have to stop if they see that one, even if it's mid-sentence. So timing is a big challenge as these students are starting this, this event, and it requires practice. When they practice, and they must practice, they need to get a sense of how long it takes for them to do like an introduction of their newscast or a close, um, and just practice so they get an idea of, of how many stories they might be able to pack into that, that four to five minutes. Um, suggest that they time themselves when they practice and the students the students who seems to be flawless and you're looking for something to put on that critique sheet this could be an area where you could challenge them a little bit you know they sound like they're a professional and you're like gosh what am i going to say what kind of you know tips can i give for this kid um you could say work on your timing even more challenge yourself to get as close to five as you can without going over five. That's really tough to do. And it's a good challenge for these students because in the real world, that's what we have to do. We have very strict time constraints. We have to keep one eye on the news copy when we're reading live and the other one on the clock. So kind of a <laughs> split, split vision there. Um, and edit as we go sometimes if we see that we're running out of time or fill if we're running short on time. So it gets to be kind of an interesting little game. You could suggest that a student who's running short on time kind of come up with an original close for their newscast, uh, such as I'm Jason Smith, KABC News. You're home for breaking news and severe weather. Uh, tune in next hour and we'll have an exclusive interview with the West Des Moines mayor something like that, just kind of have something in their pocket to pull out if they see that their newscast is running way too short, like below four minutes um, or something like that. They need to get into that four to five minute range. Um, they could also end with a temperature or ad lib something about the weather. That's pretty easy. It's 80 degrees, they could read the forecast, maybe ad lib about, there are some storms on the radar in the western part of the state moving this way, we'll bring you the latest. Um, a lot of these, some things may be included in the content that they get, but I believe there's a little bit of flexibility with ad-libbing some transitions uh, when they're radio newscasts. So if they have to fill time, they might kind of experiment a little bit and come up with a little extra line or something at the, at the end. More on our website on, on kabc.com, something like that. They, I think uh, those things are allowed, they're original and prepared ahead of time and a student may need to throw them in if they see that they're running way too short. Uh, this is a tip, just speak to the audience, not at the audience. That's always challenging, um, you know, to get students to go beyond reading words, kind of like I'm doing today on this script, uh, and get them to really speak to the audience and their listeners. I often advise them when they're reading to imagine they're telling this story to a friend or better yet, you know, a, a respected family member who does not appreciate slang, wants good mechanics of speech, and wants uh, conversational, but yet authoritative, wants things pronounced properly, you know, somebody with some, some expectations there. And uh, 
it doesn't have to be super casual, but, but if they think that in their mind, they're, they're describing, explaining what's happening. Did you hear about that car crash? You know, um, not, not that casual, but connecting with that audience is important um, rather than just speaking at someone. They need to be consistent too. I often hear students uh, read a newscast kind of straight, kind of dull when they get to a story about the Hawkeyes or the Cyclones, suddenly they get really energized and excited. You know, you could just tell these guys are much more interested in the Hawkeyes or Cyclones than they were in that new national news story they just read a, few, a minute or two earlier. So the trick is to keep that energy consistent. You know, you might remark in your critique sheet, Love that energy when you got into sports. Now challenge yourself to keep that energy throughout the entire newscast. So it sounds like, you know, the, the content you're delivering is interesting to your listener because you want your listener to be interested in this. You don't want them to be bored to tears. So that's something you could try on as well. Did some, that, that energy is really important. Also uh, encourage vocal variety to avoid the monotone, uh, vary the pitch and help them sound interesting they may have to fake it because some of these national stories are dull to them, especially a teen. Um, along with this, they don't want to get into a predictable pattern, starting every story at the top and ending at the bottom, you know, kind of that way. And sometimes you get into that pattern and try to avoid that or being sing songy when they deliver. Um, the pace is also important. They may need to speed it up to sound more energetic or they may need to slow it down if they're nervous and they talk too fast or have had some coffee in the morning or something. Um, so they could be able to pick up the pace, but I don't know where or why this has happened. There are some pronunciation things um, you could also mention with, uh, not yet, okay. Um, encourage proper pronunciation and enunciation as well. I'm hearing a lot of um, students that Kind of have difficulty with contractions, wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't. Um, they're just not enunciate clearly. Um, and actually in broadcasting, it's probably best to avoid using contractions too much because, you know, it's, it's always more clear when you're saying would not, could not, or should not, because the word can't, uh, for example, cannot, sounds like can sometimes, can't, you know, if you're, if you really punch it, it can, but it, it can, it's a little bit too close. So that could totally change the, the sentence. Um, so avoid the contractions, but if they are going to use a contraction, enunciate them clearly. Um, another thing to watch out for is uh, reading a sentence that contains a series or a list of things. I've noticed this as well. It's almost like a lot of us are losing our ability to differentiate a comma from a period. I hear this a lot, even in advertising and on national news as well. Um, for example, we're expecting thunderstorms, packing strong winds, heavy rain and hail. That doesn't sound right, right? It, it should be, it, it's, so we're expecting thunderstorms, packing strong winds, heavy rain and hail. Um, just a thought, that's something I'm hearing and something to watch out for. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, I also wanted to mention too, I understand there's a radio news broadcasting team event. I don't, I've not judged that uh, event as well, but I think many of the things that we're going to go over today um, would apply to that as well. Very similar and relevant. And I do know from experience working with co-anchors uh, doing newscasts, it does involve a little vocal choreography. So, um, and, and certainly eye contact would be helpful when you're, you know, next to someone, you can kind of point at each other or give each other hand signals to kind of, to help um, make the, the newscast flow a little bit so you don't step on each other's words. I'm gonna talk a lot about writing since these students will be getting content and forming up that newscast and, and choosing which stories to use. So we're just gonna go over a whole bunch of things here. Um, first, I need a drink of water. I'd like to talk about the mechanics of the writing. We have this phrase we use, it's called keep it simple. And basically what we're, we're going for is keeping a word count, that is the number of words per sentence fairly short. A shorter sentence is just much easier to read out loud than a run on sentence. Shorter sentences allow for the person reading out loud to read at a comfortable pace and to breathe. 
Students can learn to cut out prepositional phrases and information in a news story that's just too wordy and not necessary. And they can focus on the most interesting and the most important facts of a story. Encouraged to edit wordy sentences so that they are simple and easy to read. Um, that's, that's really important. It'll just help them sound so good because they'll be able to pause and breathe and it'll sound more natural in conversation when they're reading that newscast. So, uh, you know, in your old journalism classes, if you ever had one of those, you probably recognize the five W's and the H, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. These are elements of a story. Don't always get to use all of them in every single story, but uh, these are usually the most important facts uh, that would be included in a story. I often concern, I often encourage students to think about what they're reading and not just read the words. Many of them concentrate on the words, but they kind of forget the meaning. So if they're reading a story that's very sad, um, they need to use an appropriate tone of voice. They don't need to be over dramatic, but it wouldn't sound right to have a happy tone, you know, if they're reading a story about a, a deadly car crash or something like that. So tone is important for them to realize reading that word and what is that story really about and think about, you know, should I really sound happy when I'm doing this? I don't have to sound maudlin or overdramatic, but just informative and authoritative and just give them the facts. Avoid redundancies. It's a great way to streamline news copy. Sentences must again be shorter. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, the house was completely destroyed. There's one, there's a redundancy there. You can edit out uh, completely because either something is damaged or destroyed. So that's, that's a little tip there. You can cut out some of that redundant um, stuff. We had an example in the WHO radio newsroom recently uh, when someone wrote a story and they used uh, the sentence, something like, it was found in a cornfield outside. And so I asked the, 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 uh, my, my um, coworker who's relatively new uh, and just kind of learning the ropes, I just said gently, have you ever seen a cornfield inside? And he's like, no, I guess not, I've never seen that. So he, so he, so he scratched that out. And I just encouraged him um, that, again, making those sentences shorter is, is a really good idea. It helps you read it. Um, another one I hear, and you probably hear this too, even on national newscasts, uh, radio and television, tragic accident. Um, you know, most accidents are tragic. So the word tragic, you can cross that out. I think your listener, your viewer, if it's television, they can make that determination if an accident was tragic or not. And um, so that's a word that you could tell them to scratch out to make that sentence shorter. Um, so there's a bunch of different examples and I can just go through some of them that are kind of fun. It just kind of makes you think and, and it, it might be kind of annoying because then you'll hear this and you're like, oh wow, I did hear that. That is kind of silly to say whispered quietly. Yeah, whispering is generally quiet or brutally hacked to death. Yeah, badly decomposed body. Uh, yeah, if it's decomposed, it's badly. We had one just the other day, someone wrote uh, at the radio station, um, deceased body. Uh, deceased really isn't necessary, it's a body. Um, officially indicted, indictments are official. You hear this a lot when new study, new poll, yeah, we wouldn't be putting it on the air in a newscast if it was an old study or an old poll, because news is what is news. Uphill climb, climbing is an uphill action. Crucial battleground state, we'll hear a lot of that because of the, the elections. Um, if it's a battleground state, it's likely crucial. Uh, potentially key swing state, same thing. Um, advance warning, warning is in advance. Wanted fugitive, you know, a fugitive is generally wanted. Armed gunman, yeah, a gunman is armed. You get the idea, fatally killed, right? Nodding in agreement, we don't nod in disagreement. Uh, shrugging shoulders, what else would a shrug be? Uh, online trolls, usually trolls are online, unless they're the little doll. Uh, completely defeated, again, that's sort of like completely destroyed. Unwanted pests, unexpected surprise, mean-spirited attack. Attack is usually mean-spirited, right? 
and uh, formally sentenced. That's sort of like um, officially indicted. So there's a whole bunch of examples there that you might hear in news copy when you're hearing these, these newscasts from these students. And you could say, hey, you know, you could make that sentence shorter if you cut out um, badly decomposed body, cut out decomposed body, or cut out badly, I guess we would cut that one out. There are ways you could get rid of those redundancies. There's been an examination of um, broadcast news coverage that took place during the, the recent social unrest course across the country. And we had a discussion about all of it in a recent Iowa Broadcast News Association conference. We get together once a year and had a meeting uh, a couple of months ago. And, and we talked about the coverage that we did and um, had a discussion about it. A community advocate brought up the word, uh, brought up the point that the word riot is often not the best word to use. It's kind of a blanket word and it does describe maybe some of the stuff that was going on, but not everything, because there was a lot of peaceful pr uh, protesting. And, and so that was a kind of a problematic word that he pointed out and thought that, you know, we need to think about when writing this, is this really fair? And, and so fairness kind of works its way into this news copy as well. Um, we want to encourage active voice and present tense in our news copy. That's just the broadcast journalism style. Um, so Mary Smith is suing Buddy's Burgers uh, instead because she found a bug on her hamburger, whatever. Uh, we want, she is acting, she's suing, she's the one doing the suit, the, filing the lawsuit, as opposed to passive voice, Buddy's is being sued by Mary Smith after she found a bug on her hamburger. So the active voice is what we always want to encourage these students. And they may get copy that could be all over the board and they may have to take a look at this and think, okay, is this active voice or is this passive? I want active voice because that just sounds better. Um, also, we want to strive to use present or future tense instead of past tense, if possible. It's not always possible, but news is what is new. Past tense is history. So some of our stories um, just had one yesterday. Uh, two sheriff's deputies are recovering after a crash uh, in Mills County, something like that. And then the next sentence was uh, the state patrol says the crash happened last night. You know, so not certainly not the lead sentence. You want to lead with what is happening right now. These two deputies are recovering or are hospitalized. So that's going on right now. Um, we also, with broadcast writing, this is important too. You may have students who will put together a newscast that has someone's age in it, um, like um, John Smith, comma, 21, comma, of Cedar Rapids, is to appear in Lynn County Court today. That is uh, print style, um, to put that comma, 21, the, the, the age, in broadcast writing, you want to encourage them to spell out 21-year-old John Smith or Cedar Rapids is to be in Lynn County Court today. You don't want all those commas in there because it ends up chopping up the sentence. It'll be much easier for them to read that sentence if you spell out the age, if they're going to use the age at all. They may not need to use the age. They could skip it again just to make the sentence shorter. They could just say John Smith or Cedar Rapids, but if they are going to use, if that's relevant, you know, the story might be, it might be interesting if it's a, an 11 year old child uh, took his dad's car on a joy ride. You know, that would be kind of relevant to include the age because that would be weird, you know, unusual, hopefully not common that that, that might happen. Um, I wanna talk a lot about bias versus balance. This is a huge issue, uh, we all know. Uh, we've been talking about it. It's a nationwide discussion. We've been talking a lot about it in our newsroom at WHO2. And the goal is to be objective and fair. And I think most students, you know, they're just learning how to do this and they want to be objective and fair, um, but they may come across a news story from a trusted source and they may copy it or edit it, uh, read the words without considering the meaning. Um, and sometimes there are some loaded words in a sentence or a phrase that may sound biased, whether it's intentional or not. Students need to be reminded to train to spot that and spot that sometimes there's a little bit of a spin. Um, there, there is bias in news media, absolutely. And there's some bad journalism out there too. It's not too hard to find, um, but this event is news 
It's not an editorial. It's not opinions. It's not original oratory. It's news only. So just the facts. Um, we are seeing a trend online and also on the air, broadcast television and radio too, of almost like a hint of activism that is, uh, and opinions that are slipping into some of the news copy and some of the content that we get, we look at it and we're like, wow, you know, this, we can't read this. This, this goes beyond the facts. It almost it includes like a, an explanation, you know, like as a listener, I can figure out the ramifications of, of this political incident or, you know, I, I don't need to be told by a news anchor, well, this is really, you know, this is a, a dramatic, a, a, you know, has dramatic consequences. We want to stick to the facts. Um, here's an example that's, it's kind of a toughie, um, but it's in the news and the students might come across something like this. Uh, so I'll just read it out. Lawmakers passed a controversial bill requiring women to wait 24 hours before having an abortion. Now, this particular story did not include any additional explanation about why the bill was deemed controversial. That's the word I have an issue with. I would argue that the word controversial is not necessary because everybody knows that it's a controversial topic. And when you include the word controversial, it suddenly could sound by someone on, you know, on one side of the fence or the other on that issue, it could sound like the reader has some sort of a bias or opinion about it. You don't want to include your opinions in radio news. The fact, you know, they passed the bill. So inserting the word controversial sounds like the anchors making a judgment call. And whether they were or it was totally unintentional, which I think it happens a lot, it's just unintentional, it's always good to spot that spin and avoid bias. Um, now, if a representative involved in that bill said it was controversial and it was a direct quote, that's fine because there's attribution. Someone said it. And if you say, well, uh, Representative uh, Joe Smith said it was controversial, that's fine. Um, but uh, if it's an editorial or an original oratory, that's different, of course. But for news, as I say, one must always avoid bias. It's not easy, though, sometimes. I got to tell you, with COVID, Oh, yeah, yeah. It's affected all of us in so many different ways, uh, obviously. Um, and I'm not sure the social media echo chamber has helped either. Um, we've seen so much on social media that um, there's a lot of uh, inaccurate or maybe just incomplete information that gets shared. And sometimes there's little information beyond a flashy headline. And so that's kind of frustrating. And since we're all affected by COVID, <clears throat> you know, we have in our own newsroom, we have people that have very, very strong feelings on it. Uh, just they run the gamut, you know. Um, some of it seems to reinforce uh, values and beliefs and, you know, at, at home with, with, with others that uh, sometimes leads to conversations about what they've read, what they think they know, um, what they've gathered from social media. And they don't always um, appreciate it when I put on a new layer of information that maybe they had not considered. Um, doesn't always go over too well. I even had a conversation, you know, with, uh, Oh, a doctor recently, and and she was, you know, obviously healthcare providers are, you know, in a very unique situation. But um, we were talking about, I think, meatpacking plants and um, how they were shut down for because of the COVID outbreaks. And and I said, yeah, think about the hog farmer. Think about the farmer who can't take his hogs to market. Think about the disruption in the the supply chain and the economic toll. And she's like, oh yeah, it's you know, and she didn't like the idea of hogs being euthanized and buried and what a waste you know so it's like there's so many different layers with that story and and so many different ramifications um and i, I kind of i it's kind of the trick I, I guess my back to the high school speech teacher she would have done that to try and encourage analytical thinking um and sharpen those skills so students will see that and spot bias or maybe incomplete information and then um, try to cross it out People are very passionate about politics, obviously. Uh, student doing radio news must keep their personal bias out of that too. Uh, you may need to just remind them that it's best to be balanced so that there's a story about one um, political party or uh, a candidate supporting something or doing something. It's good to have a reaction from the other side. So the story is balanced. Um, I want to share just a little of my own experience with this. Sometimes listeners make accusations at the radio station of bias. You know, we get it from both sides. You know, we really, really do. Oh, you people are biased to the right. You people are biased to the left. 
Uh, and sometimes I've had to convince people of very strong opinions that we're doing the best we can. We have both sides of the story and we want our listeners to make uh, the decisions about what they take from it. Um, sometimes they kind of hear what they want to hear. <laughs> so they, and they'll call and I'll read the story to them and they'll realize, oh yeah, I guess that's pretty fair. Um, I have had people call and complain that I interrupted a talk show on WHO radio to, for a news bulletin because of severe weather. And I was, I was like, I, I can't help the weather. It's just what I have to do. But people are just so passionate about their, their views. I, in fact, I critique college level broadcast journalism students too and judge their entries at their competitions. And when I hear bias, I call them out on it. That their opinions about the you know, current president, for example, should not be included in an objective newscast. It's free country. They can think what they want to think. Absolutely. Keep their opinions out of the news. Um, I know a young reporter recently told me she wrote news stories in college at the same time thought they were well written. She got good grades, but she looks at them now and realizes they were kind of biased. So she believes that her writing was uh, kind of influenced and, and has evolved. Um, you you want to build trust with your audience. So these students that are doing these newscasts, um, you want them to, you know, they're not just talking to one person with one political view or mindset. They need, it's broadcasting. They need to talk with everybody and be fair. So I've been blabbering on and on and on. I wanna just see if there's any um, questions midway uh, that I could uh, answer or if we should continue. What do you think, Tom? Yeah, we do have a couple questions here, Sue. Um, do you wanna be mindful of time here? I think maybe we should kind of uh, forge ahead here. We only have about eight minutes before we have some question and answer at the end. So maybe we forge ahead here for the next eight or so minutes and then we can capture the questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. We'll talk about building a newscast. Um, they typically choose stories from a packet, I believe, at least that's what been my experience in past years. They cannot include everything in those newscasts. And it's kind of fun to hear what they choose, the stories they choose and the ones they skip. And um, they usually skip the ones with tough names. <laughs> Sometimes I do that too. Uh, I encourage students to watch TV news and listen to the radio to get familiar with names in the news. So they will be less likely to stumble over a tough name. And if they do stumble, advise them to just roll through it, just plow right through and pretend that that word, that name was supposed to be pronounced that way. So they sound confident. Um, I would also suggest that they write out a phonetic pronunciation in their copy. We should probably be doing Q and A here in the next couple minutes. Okay, let me roll through then and just um, so plow through the the tough names. Do a phonetic uh, pronunciation. This the commercial students will use a character. That's fine. It gives them some creative wiggle room. Once they've completed it, I would encourage students to avoid using the phrase "and we're back," because uh, who are we and where do we go? Uh, a simple short pause between a commercial and the rest of the newscast is fine. They could also say something like, and the news continues on WABC or whatever radio station call letters they've chosen to use. Uh, quickly, the flash, the bulletin. Um, this is fun because see how they handle this. They'll get this flash during their newscast that they've not planned on and they have to stop and pivot and read it cold. Sometimes it really throws them, but I would suggest that a student finish the sentence read the book the, the, of the current story, the story they're on, read the bulletin, and then have something in their pocket ready to say, something rehearsed that says, well, we'll have more on this breaking story in our next newscast. It just sounds so good when they do that. Just kicks it up another level. And um, so that would be my tip. And just obviously final tips, critique a teen, accentuate the positive. I uh, know yeah, you all do this anyway. I like how you did this. Next time to kick up your performance to the next level, try this and that. Students can handle constructive criticism well, and I think they want to hear what you have to say. You don't have to be soft on them. We can give them constructive, constructive criticism that'll help them get better. And um, that's about all I had time for, I think. Um, I, when I'm writing down my critique, I will write down the whole newscast. I will list it down, the call letters, story one, two, three, four, five. That's how I do it when I'm uh, doing a, a critique. So Craig, I think that's about it. Thank you, Sue, that is wonderful. And I'm gonna have Tom go into Q and A and start lining that up. But a couple things I wanted to point out is that when she was talking, she was talking about, about so many of her things, things. Um, it dealt with uh, what I thought was so wonderful. It dealt with the large group category too, and about writing and working through that. And the tips 
uh, and that you have given us. All this information will be uh, rebroadcast, so to speak, on our website through a recording on this. And Tom, are you ready for the Q&A? Absolutely, Craig. Yeah, I'll take over here. Um, and so, yeah, just to, to kind of reiterate that point about the recording, will you be able to share some of the additional items and examples that you shared with us that we can post, uh, similar, to, similar to Carl's um, one sheet page? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we can definitely make sure that those are shared with the recording as well. Um, the next question here would be, is it better to have more news stories that are shorter in length, or would it be better to have a few news stories with more detail? How many news stories should students select? It's a kind of subjective thing. I would definitely go for uh, shorter stories um, in a four to five minute time period. I mean, if they can do, uh, well, yeah, as many as they can. I mean, one story might be just three sentences long. Um, so it's, it's, I don't, I think it's, it, they could, if they have good content that they're comfortable with, I think it, it um, they could probably do, you know, maybe seven or eight. That's just a guess. Great. Awesome. Our next question here is in regards to redundancy. Uh, you had mentioned to avoid as much redundancy in writing as possible, but what if they're using repetition for impact? I guess I'm okay with that. Um, if it's, it's, um, the redundancy is more of like, you know, like when they they throw in an extra word, you know, like completely destroyed, it's unnecessary to say completely. That was, you know, because it's destroyed, it's destroyed. So the goal is to get that sentence shorter. But for impact, I mean, are you talking about like repeating a word during a sentence or, I guess I'd have to hear it. And so that might be more dealing with the large group category where they write their own copy and stuff. And so they may be doing oh. something with that. Okay. Um, I encourage that question to come to the state office and we can talk through that. All right, so our next question here um, is in regards to shortening sentences. Would short, simple sentences create a bumpier presentation? Um, there've been a lot of comment sheets from judges who want writing to flow. What would be your response to that? Well, yeah, I mean, if there, I, I think it, when you're reading out loud, um, you know, if a sentence, it, 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 it actually flows better when the sentences are shorter, I think, because if you have a run on sentence, you have to stop and breathe at some point. And it just, it just sounds better. Sometimes it looks choppy when you're looking at the copy, but gosh, look at these shorts, they look like bullet points. But when you're reading it out loud, it does kind of flow. Um, you know, they, it's not bullet points and it, it there will be an, an order and like almost like a, the inverted um, pyramid with news journalism. You put the most catchy, most information, information at the top of the story. And then some of the other details that maybe aren't so interesting would be kind of at the bottom of the story that you could uh, edit out if you don't have time for it. So generally, I think I think, I think it would flow fairly well if, if you keep your sentences fairly short. I mean, you know, um, you know, I don't have an example in front of me here. Well, just not, you don't want it to be wordy. Another thing you want to avoid too is police speak. Um, you, that comes up in, in, you know, like you might have technical terms or jargon. Um, law enforcement authorities or uh, perpetrator, lacerations, contusions, uh, you'll see a lot of this, what we call police speak. And it's not really ordinary conversation, so that might be another tip uh, to have them think about that, like, oh, yeah, that's sort of technical. Let's keep it simple. Great. Um, next question is in regards to judging. What suggestions might you have to evaluate on-air personas? Um, this, this question is, or this question, or the person who has asked this question says they often hear students aiming to entertain perhaps more than share the news. So how would you suggest to evaluate on-air personas? Yeah, I, I encountered that as well. Um, it is supposed to be a news event, not an acting event. You may have to remind the student that, that um, there are a lot of different events in IE that they can do, that they can shine their acting skills in, but this is, this is really more newsy. I mean, there's still, 
a tiny bit of performance involved, but it's not as, you know, it's pretty straightforward. And I've, I've encountered that too. And, and I'm like, I just kind of remind them on this sheet that this is not, this is just the facts, you know, just the facts, read this, you know, we, we don't really need to go over the top here. <laughs> Some will. Definitely understandable there. Uh, we do have two final questions here. I want to be respectful of everyone's time so we can move to our next presentation. So we'll finish with these last two questions. The first one is, as a judge, do you have an idea of what type of radio station that the news is on? For example, a country station might differ from a rock station, or should they just do a generic just the facts news station? I think I love it when they come up with uh, call letters, you know, country station, and, and then uh, they and maybe at the end of their newscast, you know, now the, you know, more, more country hits next hour on KXIC or whatever it is. And that's part of the fun. They get to choose the call letters and the style of the radio station. Maybe it's a commercial radio station. Maybe it's a public radio station. Um, and I think they can have a little fun with that. And they, they pick out their call letters and, and they may, yeah, if it's a rock station, for example, or uh, I don't know, um, you know, some of the stories they choose, maybe a little bit more uh, targeted toward their audience. You know, they may have a kicker in there about a musician or, you know, some performance or something like that. Uh, country music, you know, maybe their uh, target demographic is more rural. Maybe they're going to include a kicker or some other story that, that is much more um, applicable to their listeners. And their, their listeners might be interested in hearing about, uh, you know, the, something in rural America instead of international news um, that maybe not their listeners may not be that interested in kind of an obscure international news from on the other side of the world. Fantastic. And our last question here, Sue, uh, this is more of a specific example and they kind of just want your opinion on, on how this went, but um, you had been, you had spoken about filling uh, for the sake of time. And then we'd moved on to the topic of editor editorializing. Um, and this brought to mind a disqualification that this person had witnessed. Um, they were uncertain if the clipping was the news flash or for a chosen article, but the student was disqualified for filling time with a certain statement. Um, it was in regards to a soccer team that was stuck in the coal mine. And the student had said, I'm glad to hear the boys made it out safely, but they were disqualified for filling time with that. What are your thoughts on that? Hey, Sue, let me answer that. Yeah. Um, that's a, that's, a, that's a rule on page 38, question one. It talks about may they editorialize on a news copy. That was editorializing on the story. And they cannot editorialize. In transitions, they can say things that will let, uh, go into the next story, like dealing with the weather that is coming. But when they editorialized on a specific story, that was in the disqualification. So. Mm -hmm. And that's on page 38, question number one. So, hey, Sue, thank you so much. You were wonderful. You did everything we wanted to know. You gave so much information. I know people are going to be going back and looking at this over and over because the wealth of information you gave us was truly amazing. Thank you so much, Sue. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. So we're ready to get into our next presentation with Tina. And, uh, and Tom will get us onto that screen with Tina Bakehouse. And Tina Bakehouse is with us. She's gonna have a very interesting story about, like many of you, she was without uh, internet this morning, which was just wonderful. Uh, but she found a very creative way to get around it and um, I think uh, it's a wonderful story, but a little bit about Tina. Tina is the Chief Creative Officer for the Melvern Bank, which is a wonderful opportunity that through speech activities, you can fulfill other positions in this world. She was a teacher, a high school teacher. She worked for the uh, Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha. She was professor at Creighton for over a decade and outreach coordinator for Golden Hills uh, RCD. She has done many things, but probably the most outstanding thing that Tina has done is she was an IHSSA All-State Performer in three different categories. And we love Tina, and she has been an All-State critic for us. And now I give you Tina Bakehouse.
Well, thank you, Craig. I'm excited to be here. And, you know, this morning I was really pumped and excited to, to be a part of this experience. And when I woke up and heard we had no internet and reached out to my internet provider, they said, we'll be with you. And it was getting to be 9, 9.15, no internet. I decided to take uh, my creative problem solving skills and reach out and my husband actually hooked up his uh, tractor next door to my office, which has GPS. So my hotspot internet is the tractor. So only in Iowa or the rural Midwest can you have hotspot tractor. So I want to start with my uncle Don was one of the greatest storytellers that I know of. I've heard many stories about him traveling the Audubon in Germany when he was in the service and nearly meeting Elvis Presley to begging my aunt Janet to go on the first date and when he finally got her on a date he forgot his wallet and she ended up paying for the meal. And my favorite though personally is when he and Janet actually went to the wrong funeral visitation and stayed and made friends in conversation. He just has that natural knack of being able to share a story. And so we know when we see a good storyteller, it's a good story and makes those stylistic choices to keep the audience engaged so that the story resonates. And so whether it's a hero's quest type of story, a comedy story or a tragedy story, we all enjoy a good story. So why is storytelling important? Well, I think about whether you're young, older in, or in between, it's important to be able to share your personal story when you're interviewing for a job or when you're working at an organization and trying to brand or tell that organization's story to get more business. But even at a personal level, it's important to connect with friends and family and storytelling does that. You got a high school and came back and the storytelling category actually gives students that opportunity to build on their public speaking skills. And so the whole category is really to learn the art of retelling a, so a story to another person or a small group of people. And so stories have both content and delivery for IHSSA competition because about 70% or more of the professional on content said, I'm going to look at evaluating delivery. So today's workshop, I'll discuss how do we evaluate students on their vocal delivery, their physical delivery, and then the story as far as how it overall effects effectively conveys the author's message. So let's start with vocal delivery. And I like to define vocal delivery as it's everything that comes with from the mouth. So it's this area. And in terms of how the, the speech sounds, the story sounds, how it feels. And so I have in front of me here, and you will see on the IHSSA website is the storytelling evaluation form or ballot. And it lays out story as a whole, vocal delivery and physical delivery. So vocal delivery, it's conversations, conversational style, it's pronunciation, it's the pace or timing of pauses, articulation, vocal variety, and energy. So I wanna break down those terms and then give an example or two to sort of how do you think about and discuss as a judge when you're giving that oral feedback or you're at state competition and you're writing specific feedback. So the conversational style, this is really important. I remember as a student, I struggled with this as an IHSSA because I wanted to earn that one, not only at districts, not only at state, but also at all state. So I would practice and practice and practice and practice. And pretty soon when you practice something and it's a under five minute story, it's gonna be memorized, it's gonna be in that bank. Uh, so being able to communicate with the student that you want them to speak to you, to, to the audience rather than at them and not memorize the piece is really a challenge. So, like, like Dr. has to be memorized because it's 
words and it's it's poetic and it's epic as well as rhyme and it, it really expects rhyme so that would be more of a prose piece and i have seen a student do that in the past when i was judging and so it's giving that suggestion of this might work better in a prose category but talking with them about how can you share a story and that's the the, the key skill set of being spontaneous Pronunciation, and that's saying the words correctly. And I like how uh, Sue in that previous presentation talked about broadcasting and writing it out phonetically. Students may be challenged with how to say the author's name of the selection, or maybe it's a weird name of a character or city, or maybe it's like in Skippy John Jones, there's actual Spanish words. And it's really crucial and important to establish credibility by having the student be able to say those words correctly. So just noting that because a storyteller can lose an audience member if words are mispronounced or maybe even offend um, an audience member. It makes me think of also My Fair Lady, the rain in Spain stays mainly in the plane. And so having those uh, practices and, and encouraging the student to practice saying it over and over again can, can make it kind of stick in their minds. So when it comes to pace, timing, and pauses, this is where I find that students ch are challenged the most because especially when you're at districts and it's a first time performer, what happens when you get nervous? You start to tell your story and you're really excited about the story, but you're really, really nervous and you don't know what ah! racing through it to get to the end because you just and so they tend to go fast with pacing. Or if it's memorized, sometimes the flow can be sort of choppy um, and it's not feeling like it has a nice cadence. Or they might just be lost, losing their train of thought. Maybe they haven't rehearsed enough. And so they're trying to think, what's that next line? So they might have cluttered communication of vocalized pauses or verbal fillers like the ums, the ahs, the you knows. And so being able to really lay out to the student what does it sound like, feel like to have a nice fluid form of communication? And granted, this is a bit subjective. A lot of the oral interpretation is, but you can guide them in saying when you are sharing that communication, think about how you talk to a friend or a neighbor or a family member and use that voice and vary it in a way that there's moments that are spoken quickly and there's moments that there's a pause for effect or drama and there's moments where maybe you slow down and bring it in so it leads us to articulation and that's being able to pronounce the beginnings and endings of sounds and vowels and consonants and so more times than students articulating and saying words too much like this. So it's giving that feedback, that insight of saying, I really want to make sure I'm saying all those words because that will help with the impact story. Right, I love this part. This is where everything kind of comes together with how the voice that, you know, you don't want monotone talking at this level all the time when you, it tends to happen this way. But instead, it's bringing your voice up and down in decibels. It's punching search words with enthusiasm. And it's bringing out you know, various ways that your voice really adds color to the story. So I think about uh, when I performed 101 Dalmatians as a student and Cuella de Vil's 15 puppies. You know, it was really fun to bring in a variety, almost a British accent like that. And when there was a dog, you know, sounding rough like this, but then balancing that with a narrator that sounded just like my normal voice. The last one too is super important when it comes to the vocal uh, delivery and that is the energy. And that to me is the verbal oomph that the speaker, the storyteller really shares. It's that self-belief that you have delivered the performance that is at your very best vocally. And so it's bringing in the intonation, the vocal projection, and the clear, strong vocal dynamics. And I would de define vocal dynamics as, you know, the range and levels of heights of how your voice sounds. So think of it as going from soft and getting a little bit louder and louder and louder levels. 
So if you were to listen to a choir sing the same pitch, the same note at the same loudness, it would be super boring. But instead, when we listen to music and specifically with choirs, it's really a beautiful music to our ears when we hear altos, sopranos, baritones, and tenors and bass all coming together and saying it with you know, a crescendo and then bringing it down. So that's really important when it comes to voice. So when we think about vocal delivery, we're really looking at is the student you know, having that conversational style? Are they pronouncing their words correctly, having a good varied pace, articulation, vocal variety, and, and overall energy? When, and that's really your pitch, your projection, and vocal dynamics. So I am going to really focus in on uh, a story. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but just a portion of I'm Bored by Michael Ian Black. And I want you to sort of assess my vocal delivery, if you will. I'm bored, bored, blah, I'm so bored. Hey, a potato, a potato. What am I supposed to do with a potato? Ow, I'm bored. You want to do something? Sure. What do you like to do? I don't know. I like flamingos. There are no flamingos around here. Well, that's disappointing. I'm bored. What did you notice there? When it comes to vocal delivery, I would tell the student who, this was more of a prose piece, obviously it was not story, but to give you an idea of the vocal delivery, it definitely had strong projection and strength vocally. Uh, the articulation was fairly good, except for the word um, supposed. You know, sometimes that can be lost or smoothed over and out, so making sure that's said completely. But what this really, and there was some good energy in terms of strength of voice, but what I would really focus in on and say to the student is, vocal variety. Where and how could you make this story come alive by changing your voice, by maybe softening it? There was nowhere to go if you start really, really loud and at the same pitch and level. So build on that. Maybe pause a little bit. So I'm going to reread this to sort of show you what vocal variety and, and bringing in that energy to give that oomph for the story. <sighs> I'm bored. Bored. Blah, I'm so bored. Hey, a potato, potato. What am I supposed to do with a potato? Ow, oh, I'm bored. You want to do something? Sure. Well, do. I don't know. I like flamingo. There are no flamingos around here. Boy, I'm bored. So notice a little bit, now granted there was no narrator in that excerpt, but notice the different levels and some of the pauses and the punching of the words and being able to have some, some good, strong vocal delivery that, that had that loud dynamic voice that then brought it down just a little bit too. So that leads us to thinking about the physical delivery. And this is where I really stress to, to presenters to match your voice with your body. And it's sort of like an orchestra where you have all these different instruments, but it's really important that they all play and one pauses when the other one plays and then they all play in unison together. And so your voice and your body need to really be in unison to craft a strong story. You look at your ballot for I say for physical delivery, it like facial expressions, bodily suggestion of character, gestures, poise, and energy. And so when we look at facial expressions, what I find interesting is in communication research, it lays out that about 80% of our communication comes from our face. So that's an awful lot. And so when you're sharing a story for under five minutes to an audience, it's really important to have that basic movement of facial muscles to project emotions. So we have about six different emotions and that's our disgust, ugh, sadness, hmm, happiness, fear, anger, surprise, and various levels of that. And the power of your face to show that 
as well as the eye contact that you have to audience is helpful. And so something that I have noticed in the past is there's, a, there's this of level zero to 10, how animated a person is naturally, what comes natural facial expressions, one zero to one is much more solemn, more calm, not super expressive naturally to 10, which is sort of Disney style. I would say I'm a 10. Big, gregarious facial expressions. So if you have a student that maybe is more stoic and, and could use a little more facial expressions, what I have said is, you know, I don't want you to strain your face and have it be unnatural to you, but maybe consider, you know, raising your eyebrows and thinking softly about your, voice, your face so that that kind of communicates brightness. Um, so it's that non, it's that non animated, you know, non verbal communication that's really important. And so if you look the same the whole time, you know, it's not going to vary the story of communication. So building off of that is the bodily suggestion of character. And this is how the storyteller actually carries his or her body. It's those simple choices that make a good story great. And so obviously balancing the narrative with the variety of character. So it's how does the student show an old wise owl with their bodies versus a young, crazy fun puppy with their, with their bodies? So maybe it's, you know, building on and embodying that character's attitude um, in terms of how they hold their posture, you know, if they use their arms a little bit for wings and, and have those in versus, you know, young and big movements, um, you know, for a young kind of animal character. Now, the thing that you have to remind, um, similar to what Sue had noted too, is that newscasting is not dramatic acting or another acting kind of category. Storytelling kind of went on that line. I was in that era of the 90s when there wasn't a requirement for a stool. And so be sure that if you might caution in your oral critique uh, to the student that you don't want them to go too far into dramatic acting. That's a different category. But it's still, you know, they can still use and have fun with their with their upper body and their um, gestures and facial expressions to show those characters. So that leads us into what gestures are. And that is actual movement from the tips of the fingers to the elbow. And some of us are much more apt to communicate with our hands and you know who you are. I remember when I was teaching at Creighton University and I had an actual student present a speech that he had written down every single gesticulation, like every movement he was going to do for the speech and it was very robotic. And it, it just, right? And so I'd like to think of gestures shaping the communication and and thinking it's so you don't want the presenter or storyteller to be sitting on their hands, hands in the pockets, crossing their arms the whole time because that's closed communication. Nor do they have to gesture wildly the whole time either. They need to do what's natural for them and natural for the story. So if if you know giving gestures are not natural as they communicate frequently, just an occasional for emphasis gesture, or maybe they do have certain gestures for their plan that are planned for their specific characters when they're not the narrator. And maybe that takes them into a safer space. So that leads us to poise. And poise is a state of balance. It's composure, it's having confidence, it's a mindset. It's the difference between, it's sort of thinking about being a basketball player or an athlete, getting ready for the game. They play loud music. I remember in volleyball, we, we play fun music and have some, some volleyball across the net to each other and bump set spike and all of that to get jazz for our, our games. So it's that student's uh, internal confidence that they show when they walk into the space and, that, and as they're getting their uh, category and the author and title announced that they are owning the space in the room. So how do they act from that very first moment to the very last moment when they are done with their storytelling and leave the space? To me, it's a bookend, right? And I use that clip, I use that on purpose, that a bookend because it's a storytelling category. But the moment the student comes in, how they carry themselves really reflects who they are as a storyteller and is that credibility they walk off 
and then everything in between. So when they jump into a teaser or introduction, they are ready to go. That's the difference between a good and a great speech, and you can some of those suggestions for that student um, if you notice at the beginning, maybe they were swaying back and forth or shuffling um, or just looking and, and being nervous. So it's how do they own space in the room? Last thing that comes to physically is energy. And overall, this is that pattern of effort and commitment used in the creation of movement and nonverbal communication. So it's sort of similar to the voice. It's how does everything with the body from head to toe even work in sync together. And so how does the student sit on the stool? Do they have good posture? Do they lean forward to entrance the, the audience and get them engaged in the story? Do they provide really strong facial expressions? Do they meaningful and Do they close and not connected? So that leads me to, uh, before we watch the speech and evaluate it, I wanna give just some basic evaluation tips because overall, when you are evaluating storytelling, you wanna see if the student is effectively conveying the author's story. Are they emphasizing that role of narrator and peppering in the, the actual character? Are they creating a good mood and are they spontaneous? And so first off, I have five tips here to sort of think about before we evaluate an actual storytelling speech. And the first is remember there's the difference between districts and state and at districts you can get you give oral feedback as well as written feedback and you're going to see a wide range. You're going to see those that are polished and ready to go and probably all state ready. That was, I was that type of student. I was ready, let's do this thing and fully committed practicing over Christmas break. But you're also going to see those who are juggling a lot or got convinced to do it at the last minute and maybe are not as ready or the student that's practiced a lot and super, super, super nervous. So bear that in mind. So state, you, you do written comments only and you wanna make sure whether it districts or state that you note those violations, whether it's on time, failure to use the stool after the introduction, et cetera. Be specific, number two, be specific with your comments. I can't stress this enough. There was nothing worse as a student to get a written form from state and I literally had three comments that were super positive but general, like great energy, exclamation point. That doesn't tell me anything. Or improve your energy, still doesn't say anything. So you wanna to explain to the student how, for example, maybe really funny and that crazy cat boy that character really came alive to me in the story and and you continue to build on that cat's body movements by stretching your neck and then licking your pen paws to keep me engaged balance that well with your narrator so that's more specific i know especially at state you're watching you're listening and but and trying to write but if you can make those suggestions or those strengths really clear that will help the student Number three, here's some phrases that I would recommend thinking about using that sort of help the student when they think about growing as a storyteller. And the first is there are beats to a story. So give feedback to make started not as strong as they could have. And you could say, first beat. I just felt like you weren't ready and getting that energy that you needed. Or maybe it's get, praising them and saying, wow, you know, that mid beat of that story, you really had built the conflict and, and I really enjoyed by the final beat, the transformation that we learned about that character and how that story kind of summed up. So beats to a story, there's, there's generally five beats, but you can sort of lay it out as the beginning, the middle and the end. Two, you can give examples of, wow, that really adds some color or really adds layers to the story. So whether it's how they create word pictures um, or certain choices that they make with their voice or facial expressions when they have crafted a character, that kind of gives them that idea that, oh, I brought this story alive. So anything that can add color or layers to a story. Three, you personalize this piece by and fill in the blank. That's the big thing with storytelling. We all are orators and natural storytellers. That's how we're born. So it's really important to do that and share what they did. Or number four, their stylistic choices. What did they use to look, sound, and, and feel that character? Um, 
or or that emotion has reached those sensory details and emotions and bring in their imagination. Another one, five year, that really added texture when you did that sound effect. Six, you really owned the space. And this is expressing how they're being confident or really tapping into how that they presented themselves overall as an effective storyteller. Seven, this is a big one, is letting go of perfectionism, but giving into imagination. And that's with memorization. And so really storytelling to me, if we can work the, with high school students to let go of the fear of failure and to really embrace and share a great effective story, they will feel this internal um, peace, but also enthusiasm because they had done something great. So that leads me to the last couple tips here is just be conversational when you give those oral uh, comments because again your goal is to encourage those performers and encourage them to continue to practice and perform so it's because of you that they may continue to do the the IHSSA program or just continue communicating and getting better at it and lastly when you give oral feedback as well as written feedback make sure you do both strengths and and give suggestions or that feedback to help improve their performance and Start when you're giving oral suggestions with the pop, give some and note. And so with that, I'm actually going to view a five minute or so storytelling. I want you to kind of look at the ballot to the left of it on your screen and get some ideas of sort of comments that you would say or write about the story overall, vocal and physical delivery. So we can play that now. Everybody knows the story of the Three Little Pigs, or at least they think they do. But I'll let you in a little secret. Nobody knows the real story because nobody has ever heard the wolf's point of view. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I should be telling the true story of the Three Little Pigs by Jaws Siske. I'm Alexandra Wolf. I don't know this whole big bad wolf thing got started, but it's all wrong. The real story is about a sneeze and a cup of sugar. Once upon a time, I was making a birthday cake for my dear old granny, and I had a terrible <laughs> sneezing cold, and I had just ran out of sugar. So I walked down the lane to my neighbor's house. Now, this guy was a pig, and he wasn't too bright either. I mean, he built his house out of straw. I mean, can you believe it? Who in his right mind will build his house out of straw? I knocked on the door. No answer. So I called, Mr. Pig, are you in? Again, no answer. I was just about to go home. That's when my nose started to itch, and I started to huff, and puff, and you know what? The whole darn house just fell down. And in the middle of that pile of straw was the first little pig, dead as a doornail. It seemed like a shame, though, to leave a perfectly good ham dinner laying there. So I ate it up. Think of it as just a big juicy cheeseburger just laying there. I still don't have that cup of sugar though. So I continued down the lane. Now this guy was the first little pig's brother and he was a little bit smarter but not by much. He built his house out of sticks. I rang the bell in the sick house. Again, no answer. So I called, Mr. Pig, are you in? And you know what that pig yelled back? Get out of here, Wolf! Don't bother me again! I'm shaving the hairs on my chinny chin chin. I was about to go home when I felt my cold coming on. And I started to huff and puff and I And you're still not going to believe me. This guy's house fell down too. And when the dust cleared, 
There was the second little pig, dead as a doornail. Wolf's honor. Now, you know, food will spoil if you leave it out in the open. So I did the only thing there was to do. I had dinner again. I was getting awfully full, but I still don't have a cup of sugar. So I went to the next house. Now, this guy was the first and second little pig's brother. And he must have been the brains of the family because he built his house out of bricks. I knocked on the door, no answer. So I called, Mr. Pig, are you in? And do you know what that rude little poker answered? You little wolf, don't bother me again. Talk about impolite. You probably had a whole sack full of sugar and you want to give me one little cup for my dear old granny's birthday cake. What a pig! I was about to go home when I felt my cold coming on and I started to huff and puff and achoo! And do you know what that pig answered? And your old granny can sit on a pin. Now, I'm usually a pretty calm lady, but I'm so still talking about my granny like that. I just go a little bit crazy. So of course when the cops drove up, I was trying to break down his door. And the whole time I was huffing and puffing and just making a real scene. The rest, they say, is history. The reporters found out about the two pigs I had for dinner, and they figured a sick lady going to borrow a cup full of sugar didn't sound really exciting. It's like jazz up the whole story, all that huff and puff, and I'll blow your house down. And they made me the big bad wolf. That's it. That's the real story. I was framed. But maybe you can lend me a cup of sugar. So I think some people back to the student will pretend we're at districts and or back and back. So I would start with some positives of so you had some really great vocal and physical energy. For example, I really liked the wolf sneeze. It was consistent and had great dramatic effect. I also thought you did a great job of varying the pigs, uh, very various voices to distinguish characters. So I like those choices. You could have gone with a grovelly, deep voice that might have been straining your natural voice, but it worked great to be you and have your natural voice as the narrator, as a wolf, um, because it could be over the top and distracting to the audience. I also thought some good content of your beginning and your introduction. Here's some suggestions or some feedback to consider to enhance your performance. First, your vocal dynamics at the beginning of the story were big and loud, and I felt like you little room to crescendo. So maybe consider softening that vocal tone and then beginning to create the tension in the story. Also, you might, this is a suggestion, consider making a knocking sound like and different sounds of knocking for each time the wolf visits the pigs. This could really add some texture to your story. Work on the pacing. Overall, I felt it was choppy. So there were, there were places where you could speed up and slow down that cadence. So just be more conversational overall and, and share that story. And lastly, with your um, physical delivery, careful crossing those legs on the stool for most of the time. It looked less comfortable and you appeared maybe a little bit nervous. Um, but as, and lastly, with the, uh, the beginning of your story, you might consider a teaser to, or some form of hooking us more in terms of grabbing our attention. So I've heard this story often, but I really appreciated that you made it your own. So thank you for making your own unique stylistic choices. And so that's how I would give oral feedback and then write those suggestions and comments on the ballot. Um, overall, I want to highlight when we think about um, this particular storytelling event, I have judged a lot. And personally, it's not one of my favorites. And that what I want to emphasize to you as judges uh, uh, to, to be sure and stay unbiased. And so focus on that student's individual performance and the choices that they made on um, their performance and how it went rather than comparing them to maybe a previous student's performance that you've seen or just your distaste for the selection. So that's something to note. 
Well, today we, we focused on how to evaluate and impact, uh, evaluate the vocal and physical delivery overall story in the IHSSA category of storytelling. In IHSSA, you as judges can make an impact on a student's life. I know, I was that student. I remember as a sophomore at a conference uh, competition in Griswold my sophomore year, I remember a really strict judge sitting me down and having a conversation and giving me helpful feedback about my vocal fluency and telling me to relax and just to be myself. And so it's similar to what my piano teacher used to say, Thelma Justice, be sharp, don't be flat, definitely be natural. And so when you, the judge, emphasize students' needs to develop their own unique speaker style, to trust their choices, and to continue to learn and grow as effective communicators, you continue to do that. That's what IHSSA is all about. So I think it's about time here for some questions that I can answer about storytelling. And first of all, hey, and Tina, I want to say, first of all, thank you so much for fighting through uh, no internet. You know, you are like the rest of our state. <laughs> Uh, a great deal of our state is dealing with internet connectivity uh, and the way that you found ways to make this work by pulling the tractor up next to the house and using the hotspot in the tractor is amazing just as I just to say can make things happen. And yeah. I'm so thankful for what, you know, one of the things I really like what you said and then Tom will go into some questions, but one of the things that I thought was so important that you said is talked about the positives, but also don't let your personal bias of a story get involved. It is unique to that student. That student may really love that. You may dislike it completely, but you're critiquing the performance of the student. And I so appreciate that. Thank, thank you, Tina. All right, well, we will kind of wrap things up here with some question and answers uh, for Tina. Uh, Tina, the first question here is, uh, would you speak to material selection and creating a character um, acting in the selection? About picking a good story, is that the question? So I, I guess what I'll talk about is dramatic acting is, is very different than, or the acting category is different than storytelling in that acting, the, the, the student gets to use the entire space and different, you know, standing on a chair, moving with the chair, falling on the floor, all of those things. With storytelling, it's really important that the, the student and the coach selects, um, you know, I think children's books and stories can make for good stories. But you can also use folk tales too, where um, it may have only one or two characters or, or, um, and share that. Again, it's, it's tapping into the interest of the students and where their, their interest lies and what their comfort level is. For me, I really enjoy getting to develop a wide range, like some different character voices and facial expressions. And so I tend to lean towards children's stories to have to play with a little bit. But some students, that's not their comfort level. So they can certainly do a storytelling that's maybe a, you know, a softer folk tale that has still that great transformation of a hero at the end or um, a quest, et cetera. Great, thank you for that. Um, our next question, and kind of, kind of bridge two questions that were submitted into one here, but how does a judge uh, judge between going too far and not going far enough there's a fine line between acting and storytelling. And the second question that's kind of bridging to this is, during the performance that we did show as an example, where does it cross the line maybe become between storytelling and then acting? I know you mentioned the full stage, but maybe some more detail there. Sure, so the biggest thing, the difference between storytelling and um, acting is that there is a requirement from the storytelling category to after your introduction to sit on a stool and tell the story. So really the physical delivery of that individual is from the waist up. And so that includes gestures. And so, you know, just having the feet positioned comfortably 
um, as opposed to being crossed or, or swaying back and forth and things. So really it's, it's how do you, as the storyteller, share a story through facial expressions. You can lean in and give those gestures. You can, you know, if you're trying to show a fat cat, you can change your voice and puff your cheeks and kind of make your body just a little bit bigger. But what you want to be careful about is, A, definitely do not get off the stool. That becomes dramatic. That becomes the acting category. So that would be a, a, a violation. But also it's, you know, you can lean forward a little bit, but don't get, you know, so crazy again that it's distracting. It's that healthy, happy balance. So remember that the narrator is a primary character, if you will, that the narrator is telling the story and that you've balanced that role of narrator with the characters and they are support to the narrator. Perfect. That, Thank you for that question. Question. Yeah, no, that was great. Um, next question we have here is from a voice perspective. So this person has submitted the, the comment that they equate a big bad wolf character to a more masculine tone of voice. How important is it for a male student to narrate a story which mirrors a male character or how does voice play a role there? That's a great question. And that's where you can really tap into the, the imagination and what's comfortable for the student, right? Everybody's voice is really individualized. We were born with that voice and we can train it to do pretty powerful things, but how you sound, um, that intonation is really who you are. And so I think it's what, it, again, the comfort level of the student. And I'm flexible um, when I've coached or, or judged students is, does it appear and feel natural? Um, if it's straining the voice, then, then it's not the right choice. If it's um, a story told by a female and the male wants to do it, I think that's okay, and I, I don't see a problem with that, but, but definitely would not want that male student to be going in a high falsetto pitch. That's really, that would be distracting, right? So it's, it's just softening that individual's voice, maybe to um, appear less deep, if you will, and still be able to share the story. Great, thank you, Tina, for that. And at this time, there are no other open questions. So um, I, would, I would love to just, pass it along to Craig here to kind of close things up. And Tina, thank you for a great presentation as well and to all of our uh, panelists today. So Craig, take it away. Thank you, Tom. And Tina, thank you so much. You were wonderful under very tough situations. You made this happen. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. A couple things just My for pleasure. everyone. And that is that if you have not sent me an email that you're wanting to use this for judge certification, you need to send me an email so that I can email you the testing booklet on Monday of this next coming week. Also, we'll put all these presentations back on our website for you to look at and to maybe slow down, take a notes. Uh, we will also have the handouts and the PowerPoints that the people have done. And the last point is, I wanna thank all of you for being a part of this very special day. Um, this is the kickoff of speech season, and yes, we are going to do speech season. It may be different than what we've done before, but we will do a speech season, and it's going to be exciting, and this is a time where we all need to step forward as judges and coaches and adults and show the way for young people that we can survive and make this a great season for those young people. So thank you all for being here. Enjoy your rest of your weekend and great speech season ahead of us. Thank you.